The American Invasion by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. A terrible danger is hanging over the Americans in London. Their future and their reputation this season depend entirely on the success of Buffalo Bill and Mrs. Brown Potter. The former is certain to draw, for English people are far more interested in American barbarism than they are in American civilization. When they sight Sandy Hook, they look to their rifles and ammunition, and, after dining once at Delmonico's, start off for Colorado or California, from Montana or the Yellowstone Park. Rocky Mountains charm them more than riotous millionaires, they have been known to prefer buffaloes to Boston. Why should they not? The cities of America are inexpressibly tedious. The Bostonians take their learning too sadly. Culture with them is an accomplishment rather than an atmosphere. Their hub, as they call it, is the paradise of prigs. Chicago is a sort of monster shop full of bustle and bores. Political life at Washington is like political life in a suburban vestry. Baltimore is amusing for a week, but Philadelphia is dreadfully provincial, and though one can dine in New York, one could not dwell there. Better the far west, with its grizzly bears and its untamed cowboys, its free open-air life and its free open-air manners, its boundless prairie and its boundless mendacity. This is what Buffalo Bill is going to bring to London, and we have no doubt that London will fully appreciate his show. With regard to Mrs. Brown Potter, as acting is no longer considered absolutely essential for success on the English stage, there is really no reason why the pretty bright-eyed lady who charmed us all last June by her merry laugh and her nonchalant ways should not, to borrow an expression from her native language, make a big boom and paint the town red. We sincerely hope she will, for, on the whole, the American invasion has done English society a great deal of good. American women are bright, clever, and wonderfully cosmopolitan. Their patriotic feelings are limited to an admiration for Niagara and the regret for the elevated railway, and, unlike the men, they never bore us with Bunker's Hill. They take their dresses from Paris and their manners from Piccadilly, and wear both charmingly. They have a quaint pertness, a delightful conceit, a native self-assertion. They insist on being paid compliments and have almost succeeded in making Englishmen eloquent. For our aristocracy they have an ardent admiration. They adore titles and are a permanent blow to republican principles. In the art of amusing men, they are adepts, both by nature and education, and can actually tell a story without forgetting the point, an accomplishment that is extremely rare among the women of other countries. It is true that they lack repose and that their voices are somewhat harsh and strident when they land first at Liverpool, but after a time one gets to love those pretty whirlwinds in petticoats that sweep so recklessly through society and are so agitating to all duchesses who have daughters. There is something fascinating in their funny, exaggerated gestures and their petulant way of tossing the head. Their eyes have no magic nor mystery in them, but they challenge us for combat, and when we engage we are always worsted. Their lips seem made for laughter, and yet they never grimace. As for their voices, they soon get them into tune. Some of them have been known to acquire a fashionable drawl in two seasons, and after they have been presented to royalty, they all roll their R's as vigorously as a young equerry or an old lady in waiting. Still, they never really lose their accent. It keeps peeping out here and there, and when they chatter together, they are like a bevy of peacocks. Nothing is more amusing than to watch two American girls greeting each other in a drawing room or in the row. They are like children with their shrill staccato cries of wonder, their odd little exclamations. Their conversation sounds like a series of exploding crackers. 
they were exquisitely incoherent and used a sort of primitive emotional language after five minutes they are left beautifully breathless and look at each other half in amusement and half in affection if a stolid young englishman is fortunate enough to be introduced to them he is amazed at their extraordinary vivacity their electric quickness of repartee their inexhaustible store of curious catchwords he never really understands them for their thoughts flutter about with the sweet irresponsibility of butterflies but he is pleased and amused and feels as if he were in an aviary on the whole american girls have a wonderful charm and perhaps the chief secret of their charm is that they never talk seriously except about amusements they have however one grave fault their mothers dreary as were those old pilgrim fathers who left our shores more than two centuries ago to found a new england beyond the seas the pilgrim mothers who have returned to us in the nineteenth century are drearier still here and there of course there are exceptions but as a class they are either dull dowdy or dyspeptic it is only fair to the rising generation of america to state that they are not to blame for this indeed they spare no pains at all to bring up their parents properly and to give them a suitable if somewhat late education from its earliest years every american child spends most of its time in correcting the faults of its father and mother and no one who has had the opportunity of watching an american family on the deck of an atlantic steamer or in the refined seclusion of a new york boarding-house can fail to have been struck by this characteristic of their civilization in america the young are always ready to give to those who are older than themselves the full benefits of their inexperience a boy of only eleven or twelve years of age will firmly but kindly point out to his father his defects of manner or temper who are never weary of warning him against extravagance idleness late hours unpunctuality and the other temptations to which the aged are so particularly exposed and sometimes should he fancy that he is monopolizing too much of the conversation at dinner will remind him across the table of the new child's adage parents should be seen not heard nor does any mistaken idea of kindness prevent the little american girl from censuring her mother whenever it is necessary often indeed feeling that a rebuke conveyed in the presence of others is more truly efficacious than one merely whispered in the quiet of the nursery she will call the attention of perfect strangers to her mother's general untidiness her want of intellectual boston conversation immoderate love of iced water and green corn stinginess in the matter of candy ignorance of the usages of the best baltimore society bodily ailments and the like in fact it may be truly said that no american child is ever blind to the deficiencies of its parents no matter how much it may love them yet somehow this educational system has not been so successful as it deserved in many cases no doubt the material with which the children had to deal was crude and incapable of real development but the fact remains that the american mother is a tedious person the american father is better for he is never seen in london he passes his life entirely in wall street and communicates with his family once a month by means of a telegram in cipher the mother however is always with us and lacking the quick imitative faculty of the younger generation remains uninteresting and provincial to the last in spite of her however the american girl is always welcome she brightens our dull dinner parties for us and makes life go pleasantly by for a season in the race for coronets she often carries off the prize but once she has gained the victory she is generous and forgives her english rivals everything even their beauty warned by the example of her mother that american women do not grow old gracefully she tries not to grow old at all and often succeeds she has exquisite feet and hands is always bien chaussé et bien ganti and can talk brilliantly upon any subject provided that she knows nothing about it 
Her sense of humour keeps her from the tragedy of a grand passion, and, as there is neither romance nor humility in her love, she makes an excellent wife. What her ultimate influence on English life will be, it is difficult to estimate at present, but there can be no doubt that, of all the factors that have contributed to the social revolution of London, there are few more important, and none more delightful, than the American Invasion. End of the American Invasion by Oscar Wilde Recording by Peter Tomlinson Sermon number 20 by Charles Spurgeon Carnal Mind, Enmity Against God Delivered on Sabbath morning, April 22, 1855 At the Exeter Hall, Strand This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Leighton Garner, Panama City, Panama, in January 2018. The carnal mind is enmity against God, Romans 8, 7. This is a very solemn indictment, which the Apostle Paul here prefers against the carnal mind. He declares it to be enmity against God. When we consider what man once was, only second to the angels, the companion of God, who walked with him in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day, when we think of him as being made in the very image of his Creator, pure, spotless, and unblemished, we cannot but feel bitterly grieved to find such an accusation as this preferred against us as a race. We may well hang our harps upon the willows, while we listen to the voice of Jehovah solemnly speaking to his rebellious creature. How art thou fallen from heaven, thou son of the morning? Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. There is much to sadden us in a view of the ruins of our race. As the Carthaginian, who might tread the desolate site of his much-loved city, would shed many tears when he saw it laid in heaps by the Romans. Or as the Jew, wandering through the deserted streets of Jerusalem, would lament that the plowshare had marred the beauty and glory of that city, which was the joy of the whole earth. So ought we to mourn for ourselves and our race when we behold the ruins of that goodly structure which God had piled, that creature, matchless in symmetry, second only to angelic intellect, that mighty being, man, when we behold how he has fallen, fallen, fallen from his high estate, and lies in a mass of destruction. A few years ago a star was seen, blazing out with considerable brilliance, but soon disappeared, it has since been affirmed that it was a world on fire, thousands of millions of miles from us. And yet the rays of the conflagration reached us. The noiseless messenger of light gave to the distant dwellers on this globe the alarm of a world on fire. But what is the conflagration of a distant planet? What is the destruction of the mere material of the most ponderous orb compared with this fall of humanity? this wreck of all that is holy and sacred in ourselves. To us, indeed, the things are scarcely comparable, since we are deeply interested in the one, but not in the other. The fall of Adam was our fall. We fell in and with him. We were equal sufferers. It is the ruin of our own house that we lament. It is the destruction of our own city that we bemoan. When we stand and see written, in lines too plain for us to mistake their meaning. The carnal mind, that very self-same mind which was once holiness and has now become carnal, is enmity against God. 
May God help me this morning solemnly to prefer this indictment against all. Oh, that the Holy Spirit may so convince us of sin that we may unanimously plead guilty before God. There is no difficulty in understanding my text. It needs scarcely any explanation. We all know that the word carnal here signifies fleshy. The old translators rendered the passage thus. The mind of the flesh is enmity against God. That is to say, the natural mind, that soul which we inherited from our fathers, that which was born within us when our bodies were fashioned by God, the fleshy mind, the pharaonimus sarcos, the lusts, the passions of the soul, it is this which has gone astray from God, and become enmity against him. But, before we enter upon a discussion of the doctrine of the text, observe how strongly the apostle expresses it. The carnal mind, he said, is enmity against God. He uses a noun and not an adjective. He does not say it is opposed to God merely, but it is a positive enmity. It is not black, but blackness. It is not at enmity, but enmity itself. It is not corrupt, but corruption. It is not rebellious, it is rebellion. It is not wicked, it is wickedness itself. The heart, though it be deceitful, is positively deceit. It is evil in the concrete, sin in the essence. It is the distillation, the quintessence, of all things that are vile. It is not envious against God, it is envy. It is not at enmity, it is actual enmity. Nor need we say a word to explain that it is enmity against God. It does not charge manhood with an aversion merely to the dominion laws or doctrines of Jehovah but it strikes a deeper and surer blow. It does not strike man upon the head, it penetrates into his heart. It lays the axe at the root of the tree, and pronounces him enmity against God, against the person of the Godhead, against the deity, against the mighty maker of this world. Not at enmity against his Bible, or against his gospel, though that were true, but against God himself against his essence, his existence, and his person. Let us then weigh the words of the text, for they are solemn words. They are well put together by that master of eloquence, Paul. And they were moreover dictated by the Holy Spirit, who telleth man how to speak aright. May he help us to expound, as he has already given us the passage to explain. We shall be called upon to notice this morning, first, the truthfulness of this assertion, secondly, the universality of the evil here complained of, thirdly, we will still further enter into the depths of the subject and press it into your hearts by showing the enormity of the evil, and after that, should we have time, we will deduce one or two doctrines from the general fact. First, we are called upon to speak of the truthfulness of this great statement. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It needs no proof, for since it is written in God's word, we as Christian men are bound to bow before it. The words of the scriptures are words of infinite wisdom. And if reason cannot see the ground of a statement of revelation, it is bound, most reverently, to believe it, since we are well assured, even should it be above our reason, that it cannot be contrary thereunto. Here I find it written in the scriptures, The carnal mind is enmity against God, and that of itself is enough for me. But did I need witnesses, I would conjure up the nations of antiquity, I would unroll the volumes of ancient history, I would tell you of the awful deeds of mankind. It may be I might move your souls to detestation, if I spake of the cruelty of this race to itself, if I showed you how it made the world an acladama by its wars, and deluged it with blood by its fightings and murderers, if I should recite the blacklist of vices in which the whole nations have indulged, or even bring before you the characters of some of the most eminent philosophers, I should blush to speak of them, and you would refuse to hear. Yea, it would be impossible for you, as refined inhabitants of a civilized country, 
to endure the mention of the crimes that were committed by these very men who nowadays are held up as being paragons of perfection i fear if all the truth were written we should rise up from reading the lives of earth's mightiest heroes and proudest sages and would say at once of all of them they are clean gone out of the way they are altogether become unprofitable there is none that doeth good no not one and did not that suffice i would point you to the delusions of the heathen i would tell you of their priestcraft by which their souls have been enthralled in superstition i would drag their gods before you i would let you witness the horrid obscenities the diabolical rites which are to these besotted men most sacred things then after you had heard what the natural religion of man is i would ask what must his irreligion be if this is his devotion what must be his impiety if this be his ardent love of the godhead what must his hatred thereof be ye would i am sure at once confess did ye know what the race is that the indictment is proven and that the world must unreservedly and truthfully exclaim guilty a further argument i might find in the fact that the best of men have been always the readiest to confess their depravity the holiest men the most free from impurity have always felt it most he whose garments are the whitest will best perceive the spots upon them he whose crown shineth the brightest will know when he hath lost a jewel he who giveth the most light in the world will always be able to discover his own darkness the angels of heaven veil their faces and the angels of god on earth his chosen people must always veil their faces with humility when they think of what they were here david he was none of those who boast of a holy nature and a pure disposition he says behold i was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me here all those holy men who have written in the inspired volume and ye shall find them all confessing that they were not clean no not one yea one of them exclaimed o wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from this body of death a further argument i might find in the fact that the best of men have been always the readiest to confess their depravity the holiest men the most free from impurity have always felt it most he whose garments are the whitest will best perceive the spots upon them he whose crown shineth the brightest will know when he hath lost a jewel he who giveth the most light in the world will always be able to discover his own darkness the angels of heaven veil their faces and the angels of god on earth his chosen people must always veil their faces with humility when they think of what they were here david he was none of those who boast of a holy nature and a pure disposition he says behold i was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me here all those holy men who have written in the inspired volume and ye shall find them all confessing that they were not clean no not one yea one of them exclaimed o wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from this body of death and more i will summon one other witness to the truthfulness of this fact who shall decide the question it shall be your conscience conscience i will put thee in the witness box and cross-examine thee this morning conscience truly answer be not drugged with the laudanum of self-security speak the truth didst thou never hear the heart say i wish there was no god have not all men at times wished that our religion were not true though they could not entirely rid their souls of the idea of the godhead did they not wish that there might not be a god have they not had the desire that it might turn out that all these divine realities were a delusion a farce and an imposture yea saith every man that has crossed my mind sometimes i have wished i might indulge in folly i have wished that there were no laws to restrain me i have wished as the fool that there were no god that passage in the psalms the fool has said in his heart there is no god is wrongly translated it should be the fool hath said in his heart no god the fool does not say in his heart there is no god for he knows there is a god but he says no god 
I don't want any. I wish there were none. And who amongst us has not been so foolish as to desire that there were no God? Now, conscience, answer another question. Thou hast confessed that thou hast at times wished there were no God. Now suppose a man wished another dead. Would not that show that he hated him? Yes, it would. And so, my friends, the wish that there were no God proves that we dislike God. When I wish such a man dead and rotting in his grave, when I desire that he were non-est, I must hate that man. Otherwise, I should not wish him to be extinct. So that wish, and I do not think there has been a man in this world who has not had it, proves that the carnal mind is enmity against God. But conscience, I have another question. Has not thine heart ever desired, since there is a God, that he were a little less holy, a little less pure, so that those things which are now great crimes might be regarded as venial offenses, as picadillos? Has thy heart never said, Would to God these sins were never forbidden, would that he would be merciful and pass them by without an atonement, would that he were not so severe, so rigorously just, so sternly strict to his integrity? Hast thou never said that, my heart? Conscience must reply, Thou hast. Well, that wish to change God proves that thou art not in love with the God that now is, the God of heaven and earth. And though thou mayest talk of natural religion, and boast that thou dost reverence the God of green fields, the grassy meads, the swelling flood, the rolling thunder, the azure sky, the starry night, and the great universe, though thou lovest the poetic bow ideal of deity, it is not the God of Scripture, for thou hast wished to change his nature, and in that hast thou proved that thou art at enmity with him. But wherefore, conscience, should I go thus round about? Thou canst bear faithful witness, if thou wouldst speak the truth, that each person here has so transgressed against God, so continually broken his laws, violated his Sabbath, trampled on his statutes, despised his gospel, that it is true, ay, most true, that the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now, secondly, we are called upon to notice the universality of this evil. What a broad assertion it is. It is not a single carnal mind or a certain class of characters, but the carnal mind. It is an unqualified statement, including every individual. Whatever mind may properly be called carnal, not having been spiritualized by the power of God's Holy Ghost, is enmity against God. Observe then, first of all, the universality of this is to all persons. Every carnal mind in the world is at enmity against God. This does not exclude even infants at the mother's breast. We call them innocent, and so they are of actual transgression. But as the poet says, within the youngest breast there lies a stone. There is in the carnal mind of an infant enmity against God. It is not developed, but it lieth there. Some say that children learn sin by imitation. But no, take a child away. Place it under the most pious influences. Let the very air it breathes be purified by piety. Let it constantly drink in draughts of holiness. Let it hear nothing but the voice of prayer and praise. Let its ear be always kept in tune by notes of sacred song. And that child, notwithstanding, may still become one of the grossest of transgressors. And though placed apparently on the very road to heaven, it shall if not directed by divine grace, march downwards to the pit. Oh, how true it is that some who have had the best of parents have been the worst of sons, that many who have been trained up under the most holy auspices, in the midst of the most favorable schemes for piety, have nevertheless become loose and wanton. So it is not by imitation, but it is by nature, that the child is evil, Grant me that the child is carnal, and my text says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. 
the young crocodile i have heard when broken from the shell will in a moment begin to put itself in a posture of attack opening its mouth as if it had been taught and trained we know that young lions when tamed and domesticated still will have the wild nature of their fellows of the forest and were liberty given them would prey as fiercely as others so with the child you may bind him with the green withs of education you may do what you will with him since you cannot change his heart that carnal mind shall still be at enmity against god and notwithstanding intellect talent and all you may give to boot it shall be of the same sinful complexion of every other child if not as apparently evil for the carnal mind is enmity against god and if this applies to children equally does it include every class of men there be some men that are born into this world master spirits who walk about as giants wrapped in mantles of light and glory i refer to the poets men who stand aloft like colossi mightier than we seeming to be descended from celestial spheres there be others of acute intellect who searching into mysteries of science discover things that have been hidden from the creation of the world men of keen research and mighty erudition and yet of each of these poet philosopher metaphysician and great discoverer it shall be said the carnal mind is enmity against god you may train him up you may make his intellect almost angelic ye may strengthen his soul until he shall take what are riddles to us and unravel them with his fingers in a moment ye may make him so mighty that he can grasp the iron secrets of the eternal hills and grind them to atoms in his fist you may give him an eye so keen that he can penetrate the arcana of rocks and mountains you may add a soul so potent that he may slay the giant sphinx that had for ages troubled the mightiest men of learning yet when ye have done all his mind shall be a depraved one and his carnal heart shall still be in opposition to god yea more ye shall bring him to the house of prayer ye shall make him sit constantly under the clearest preaching of the word where he shall hear the doctrines of grace in all their purity attended by a holy unction but if that holy unction does not rest upon him all shall be in vain he shall still come most regularly but like the pious door of the chapel that turneth in and out he shall still be the same having an outside superficial religion and his carnal mind shall still be at enmity against god now this is not my assertion it is the declaration of god's word and you must leave it if you do not believe it but quarrel not with me it is my master's message and it is true of every one of you men women and children and myself too that if we have not been regenerated and converted if we have not experienced a change of heart our carnal mind is still at enmity against god again notice the universality of this at all times the carnal mind is at all times enmity against god oh say some it may be true that we are at times opposed to god but surely we are not always so there are moments says one when i feel rebellious at times my passions lead me astray but surely there are other favorable seasons when i really am friendly to god and offer true devotion i have continues the objector stood upon the mountain top until my whole soul has kindled with the scene below and my lips have uttered the song of praise these are thy glorious works parent of good almighty thine this universal frame this wonder is fair thyself how wondrous then yes but mark what is true one day is not false another the carnal mind is enmity against god at all times the wolf may sleep but it is a wolf still the snake with its azure hues may slumber amid the flowers and the child may stroke its slimy back but it is a serpent still it does not change its nature though it is dormant the sea is the house of storms even when it is glassy like a lake the thunder is still the mighty rolling thunder when it is so much aloft that we hear it not and the heart when we perceive not its ebullitions 
when it belches not forth its lava and sends not forth the hot stones of its corruption is still the same dread volcano at all times at all hours at every moment i speak this as god speaketh it if ye are carnal ye are each one of you enmity against god another thought concerning the universality of this statement the whole of the mind is enmity against god the text says the carnal mind is enmity against god that is the entire man every part of him every power every passion it is a question often asked what part of man was injured by the fall some think that the fall was only felt by the affections and that the intellect was unimpaired this they argue from the wisdom of man and the mighty discoveries he has made such as the law of gravitation the steam engine and the sciences now i consider these things as being a very mean display of wisdom compared with what is to come in a hundred years and very small compared with what might have been if man's intellect had continued in its pristine condition i believe that the fall crushed man entirely albeit when it rolled like an avalanche upon the mighty temple of human nature some shafts were still left undestroyed and amidst the ruins you find here and there a flute a pedestal a cornice a column not quite broken yet the entire structure fell and its most glorious relics are fallen ones leveled in the dust the whole of man is defaced look at our memory is it not true that the memory is fallen i can recollect evil things far better than those which savor of piety i hear a ribald song that music of hell shall jar in my ears when gray hairs shall be upon my head i hear a note of holy praise alas it is forgotten for memory graspeth with an iron hand ill things but the good she holds with feeble fingers she suffereth the glorious timbers from the forest of lebanon to swim down the stream of oblivion but she stoppeth all the draught that floateth from the foul city of sodom she will retain evil she will lose good memory is fallen so are the affections we love everything earthly better than we ought we soon fix our heart upon a creature but very seldom on the creator and when the heart is given to jesus it is prone to wander look at the imagination too oh how can the imagination revel when the body is in an ill condition only give man something that shall well nigh intoxicate him drug him with opium and how will his imagination dance with joy like a bird uncaged how will it mount with more than eagle's wings he sees things he had not dreamed of even in the shade of night why did not his imagination work when his body was in a normal state when it was healthy simply because it is depraved and until he had entered a foul element until the body had begun to quiver with a kind of intoxication the fancy would not hold its carnival we have some splendid specimens of what men could write when they have been under the accursed influence of ardent spirits it is because the mind is so depraved that it loves something which puts the body into an abnormal condition and here we have a proof that the imagination itself has gone astray so with judgment i might prove how ill it decides so might i accuse the conscience and tell you how blind it is and how it winks at the greatest follies i might review all our powers and write upon the brow of each one traitor against heaven traitor against god the whole carnal mind is enmity against god now my hearers the bible alone is the religion of protestants but whenever i find a certain book much held in reverence by our episcopalian brethren entirely on my side i always feel the greatest delight in quoting from it do you know i am one of the best churchmen in the world the very best if you will judge me by the articles and the very worst if you measure me in any other way measure me by the articles of the church of england and i will not stand second to any man under heaven's blue sky in preaching the gospel contained in them for if there be an excellent epitome of the gospel it is to be found in the articles of the church of england 
Let me show you that you have not been hearing strange doctrine. Here is the ninth article upon original or birth sin. Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, as the Pelagians do vainly talk, but it is the fault and corruption of the nature of every man that naturally is engendered of the offspring of Adam, whereby man is very far gone from original righteousness, and is of his own nature inclined to evil, so that the flesh lusteth always contrary to the spirit, and therefore in every person born into this world it deserveth God's wrath and damnation. And this infection of nature doth remain, yea, in them that are regenerated, whereby the lust of the flesh, called in the Greek, Phronema sarcos, which some do expound the wisdom, some sensuality, some the affection, some of the desire of the flesh, is not subject to the law of God. And although there is no condemnation for them that believe and are baptized, yet the apostle doth confess that concupiscence and lust hath of itself the nature of sin. I want nothing more. Will any one who believes in the prayer book dissent from the doctrine that the carnal mind is enmity against God. I have said that I would endeavor, in the third place, to show the great enormity of the guilt. I do fear, my brethren, that very often when we consider our state, we think not so much of the guilt as of the misery. I have sometimes read sermons upon the inclination of the sinner to evil, in which it has been very powerfully proved and certainly the pride of human nature has been well humbled and brought low. But one thing always strikes me. If it is left out, as being a very great omission, I refer to the doctrine that man is guilty in all of these things. If his heart is against God, we ought to tell him it is his sin. And if he cannot repent, we ought to show him that sin is the sole cause of his disability, and that all his alienation from God is sin that as long as he keeps from God, it is sin. I fear many of us here must acknowledge that we do not charge the sin of it to our own consciences. Yes, say we, we have many corruptions. Oh yes, but we sit down very contented. My brethren, we ought not to do so. The having those corruptions is our crime, which should be confessed as an enormous evil. And if I, as a minister of the gospel, do not press home the sin of the thing, I have missed what is the very virus of it. I have left out the very essence, if I have not shown that it is a crime. Now, the carnal mind is enmity against God. What a sin it is! This will appear in two ways. Consider the relation in which we stand to God, and then remember what God is. And after I have spoken of these two things, I hope you will see, indeed, that it is a sin to be at enmity with God. What is God to us? He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He bears up the pillars of the universe. His breath perfumes the flowers. His pencil paints them. He is the author of the fair creation. We are the sheep of his pasture. He hath made us, and not we ourselves. He stands to us in the relationship of a maker and a creator and from that fact he claims to be our king. He is our legislator, our lawmaker, and then, to make our crime still worse and worse, he is the ruler of providence, for it is he who keeps us from day to day. He supplies our wants. He keeps the breath within our nostrils. He bids the blood still pursue its course through the veins. He holdeth us in life, and preventeth us from death. He standeth before us, our Creator, our King, our Sustainer, our Benefactor. And I ask, is it not a sin of enormous magnitude? Is it not high treason against the Emperor of Heaven? Is it not an awful sin, the depth of which we cannot fathom with the line of all our judgment, that we, His creatures, dependent upon Him, should be at enmity with God? But the crime may seem to be worse when we think of what God is. Let me appeal personally to you in an interrogatory style, for this has weight with it. Sinner, why art thou at enmity with God? God is the God of love. He is kind to his creatures. He regards you with his love of benevolence. For this very day his Son hath shone upon you, 
This day you have had food and raiment, and you have come up here in health and strength. Do you hate God because he loves you? Is that the reason? Consider how many mercies you have received at his hands all your life long. You were born with a body, not deformed. You have had a tolerable share of health. You have been recovered many times from sickness. When lying at the gates of death, his arm has held back your soul from the last step to destruction. Do you hate God for all of this? Do you hate him because he spared your life by his tender mercy? Behold his goodness that he has spread before you. He might have sent you to hell, but you are here. Now do you hate God for sparing you? O wherefore art thou at enmity with him? My fellow creature, dost thou not know that God sent his Son from his bosom, hung him on the tree, and there suffered him to die for sinners, the just for the unjust? And dost thou hate God for that? O sinner, is this the cause of thine enmity? Art thou so estranged that thou givest enmity for love? And when he surroundeth thee with favors, girdeth thee with mercies, encircleth thee with loving kindness, dost thou hate him for this? He might say, as Jesus did to the Jews, For which of these works do ye stone me? For which of these works do ye hate God? Did an earthly benefactor feed you? Would you hate him? Did he clothe you? Would you abuse him to his face? Did he give you talents? Would you turn those powers against him? O oh, speak! Would you forge the iron and strike the dagger into the heart of your best friend? Do you hate your mother, who nursed you on her knee? Do you curse your father, who so wisely watched over you? Nay, ye say, we have some little gratitude towards earthly relatives. Where are your hearts, then? Where are your hearts, that ye can still despise God and be at enmity with him? O diabolical crime! O satanic enormity! O iniquity! for which words fail in description. To hate the all-lovely, to despise the essentially good, to abhor the constantly merciful, to spurn the ever-beneficent, to scorn the kind, the gracious one. Above all, to hate the God who sent his Son to die for man. Ah, in that thought the carnal mind is enmity with God. There is something which may make us shake, for it is a terrible sin to be at enmity with God. I would I could speak more powerfully, but my master alone can impress upon you the enormous evil of this horrid state of heart. Fourthly, but there are one or two doctrines which we will try to deduce from this. Is the carnal mind at enmity with God? Then salvation cannot be by merit, it must be by grace. If we are at enmity with God, what merit can we have? How can we deserve anything from the being we hate? Even if we were as pure as Adam, we could not have any merit, for I do not think Adam had any desert before the Creator. When he had kept all his master's law, he was but an unprofitable servant. He had done no more than he ought to have done. He had no surplus, no balance. But since we have become enemies, how much less can we hope to be saved by works? Oh no, but the whole Bible tells us from the beginning to end that salvation is not by the works of the law, but by the deeds of grace. Martin Luther declared that he constantly preached justification by faith alone, because, said he, the people would forget it, so that I was obligated almost to knock my Bible against their heads, to send it into their hearts. So it is true, we constantly forget that salvation is by grace alone. We always want to be putting in some little scrap of our own virtue. We want to be doing something. I remember a saying by old Matthew Wilkes, Saved by your works? You might as well try to go to America in a paper boat. Saved by your works? It is impossible. Oh no, the poor legalist is like a blind horse going round and round the mill, or like the prisoner going up the tread wheel and finding himself no higher after all he has done. He has no solid confidence, no firm ground to rest upon. He has not done enough, never enough. Conscience always says, this is not perfection, it ought to have been better. Salvation for enemies must be by an ambassador, by an atonement, yea, by Christ. Another doctrine we gather from this is, 
the necessity of an entire change of our nature. It is true that at birth we are at enmity with God. How necessary then it is that our nature should be changed. There are few people who sincerely believe this. They think that if they cry, Lord, have mercy upon me, when they lay a dying, they shall go to heaven directly. Let me suppose an impossible case for a moment. Let me imagine a man entering heaven without a change of heart. He comes within the gates. He hears a sonnet. He starts. It is to the praise of his enemy. He sees a throne, and on it sits one who is glorious. But it is his enemy. He walks streets of gold. But those streets belong to his enemy. He sees hosts of angels. But those hosts are the servants of his enemy. He is in an enemy's house. For he is at enmity with God. He could not join the song. For he would not know the tune. Then he would stand, silent, motionless, till Christ would say, with a voice louder than ten thousand thunders, What doest thou here? Enemies at a marriage banquet? Enemies in the children's house? Enemies in heaven? Get thee gone. Depart ye cursed into everlasting fire in hell. O oh, sirs, if the unregenerate man could enter heaven, I mention once more the oft-repeated saying of Whitefield, he would be so unhappy in heaven that he would ask God to let him run down to hell for shelter. There must be a change if ye consider the future state, for how can enemies to God ever sit down at the banquet of the Lamb? And to conclude, let me remind you, and it is in the text after all, that this change must be worked by a power beyond your own. An enemy may possibly make himself a friend, but enmity cannot. If it be but an adjunct of his nature to be an enemy, he may change himself into a friend, but if it is the very essence of his existence to be enmity, positive enmity, enmity cannot change itself. No, there must be something done more than what we can accomplish. This is just what is forgotten in these days. We must have more preaching of the Holy Spirit if we are to have more conversion work. I tell you, sirs, if you change yourself and make yourself better and better and better a thousand times, you will never be good enough for heaven till God's Spirit has laid hand upon you, till he has renewed the heart, till he has purified the soul till he has changed the entire spirit and new made the man, there can be no entering heaven. How seriously then should each stand and think, Here am I a creature of a day, a mortal born to die, but yet an immortal. At present I am at enmity with God. What shall I do? Is it not my duty as well as my happiness to ask whether there be a way to be reconciled to God? And to conclude, let me remind you, and it is in the text after all, that this change must be worked by a power beyond your own. An enemy may possibly make himself a friend, but enmity cannot. If it be but an adjunct of his nature to be an enemy, he may change himself into a friend, but if it is the very essence of his existence to be enmity, positive enmity, enmity cannot change itself. No, there must be something done more than we can accomplish. This is just what is forgotten in these days. We must have more preaching of the Holy Spirit if we are to have more conversion work. I tell you, sirs, if you change yourself and make yourself better and better and better a thousand times, you will never be good enough for heaven till God's Spirit has laid hand upon you, till he has renewed the heart, till he has purified the soul till he has changed the entire spirit and new made the man, there can be no entering heaven. How seriously then should each stand and think, Here am I a creature of a day, a mortal born to die, but yet an immortal. At present I am at enmity with God. What shall I do? Is it not my duty as well as my happiness to ask whether there be a way to be reconciled to God? O oh, weary slaves of sin, are not your ways the paths of folly? Is it wisdom? O oh, my fellow creatures, is it wisdom to hate your Creator? Is it wisdom to stand in opposition against Him? Is it prudent to despise the riches of His grace? If it be wisdom, 
it is hell's wisdom. If it be wisdom, it is a wisdom which is folly with God. O oh, may God grant you that you may turn unto Jesus with full purpose of heart. He is the ambassador. He it is who can make peace through his blood. And though you came in here an enemy, it is possible you may go out through that door, a friend yet, if you can but look to Jesus Christ, the brazen serpent, which was lifted up. And now, it may be, some of you are convinced of sin by the Holy Spirit. I will now proclaim to you the way of salvation. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Behold, O trembling penitent, the means of thy deliverance. Turn thy tearful eye to yonder mount of Calvary. See the victim of justice, the sacrifice of atonement for your transgression. View the Savior in his agonies, with streams of blood purchasing thy soul, and with intensest agonies enduring thy punishment. He died for thee, if now thou dost confess thy guilt. O come, thou condemned one, self-condemned, and turn thy eye this way, for one look will save. Sinner, thou art bitten. Look, it is not but look, it is simply look. If thou canst but look to Jesus, thou art safe. Hear the voice of the Redeemer. Look unto me, and be ye saved. Look, 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 O guilty souls. Venture on him, venture wholly. Let no other trust intrude. None but Jesus can do helpless sinners good. May my beloved Master help you to come to him and draw you to his Son. For Jesus' sake, amen and amen. End of Charles Spurgeon's Sermon Number 20, 1855 The Carnal Mind is Enmity Against God Classification of Fools from In Praise of Folly by Desidrius Erasmus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Classification of Fools by Desidrius Erasmus Of all the men whose doings I have witnessed, the most sordid are men of trade and appropriately so, for they handle money, a very sordid thing indeed. Yet, though they lie, pilfer, cheat, and impose on everybody, as soon as they grow rich they are looked up to as princes. But as I look round among the various classes of men, I especially note those who are esteemed to possess more than ordinary sagacity. Among these a foremost place is occupied by schoolmasters. How miserable would these be were it not for I, folly, of my benevolence, ameliorate their wretchedness, and render them insanely happy in the midst of their drudgery. Their lot is one of semi-starvation and of debasing slavery. In schools, those bride wells of uproar and confusion they grow prematurely old and broken down. Yet, thanks to my good services, they know not their own misery. For in their own estimation they are mighty fine fellows, strutting about and striking terror into the hearts of trembling urchins, half scarifying the little wretches with straps, canes, and birches. They are, apparently, quite unconscious of the dust and dirt with which their schoolrooms are polluted. In fact, their own most wretched servitude is to them a kingdom of felicity. Poets owe less to me, yet they too are enthusiastic devotees of mine, for their entire business consists of tickling the ear of fools with silly ditties and ridiculous romantic tales. Of the service of my attendants, Polatua, self-approbation, and Colachia, flattery, they never fail to avail themselves. And really I do not know that there is any other class of men in the world amongst whom I should find more devoted and constant followers. Moreover, there are rhetoricians. Quintilian, the prince of them all, has written an immense chapter on no more serious subject 
than how to excite a laugh. Those, again, who hunt after immortal fame in the domain of literature unquestionably belong to my fraternity. Poor fellows! They pass a wretched existence poring over their manuscripts. And for what reward? For the praise of the very, very limited few who are capable of appreciating their airy edition. Very naturally, the barristers merit our attention next. Talk of female garrulity. Why, I would back any one of them to win a prize for chattering against any twenty of the most talkative women that you could pick out. And well indeed would it be if they had no worse fault than that. I am bound to say that they are not only loquacious, but pugnacious. Their quarrelsomeness is astounding. After these come the bearded and gowned philosophers. Their insane self-deception as to their sagacity and learning is very delightful. They beguile their time with computing the magnitude of the sun, moon, and stars, and they assign causes for all the phenomena of the universe, as if nature had initiated them into all her secrets. In reality, they know nothing, but profess to know everything. The End of Classification of Fools by Desidrus Erasmus Elijah Lovejoy, abolitionist, journalist, killed at Alton, Illinois, 1837. From History of the Rise and Progress of the Alton Riots, Cumulating in the Death of Reverend Elijah P. Lovejoy, November 7, 1837, by Henry Tanner, published in 1878. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The history of the Alton Riots would not be complete without the early life of Mr. Lovejoy, whose genuine Christian character has been little known and still less understood. Reverend Elijah Parrish Lovejoy was born in Albion, Maine, November 8, 1802. He would have been 35 years old the day after he was murdered. He was a son of Reverend Daniel Lovejoy, a Congregational minister. He was a graduate of Waterville College, and soon after graduating, he emigrated to St. Louis, Missouri, where for several years he taught a school. Subsequently, he became editor of the St. Louis Times and advocated the election of Henry Clay for the presidency. His writings exhibited talents of a very high order and were appreciated by his co-workers. During this period, Mr. Lovejoy was what is denominated a skeptic, though far from being an infidel. But in a revival of religion in St. Louis in 1832, he was converted, and soon after he entered Princeton Theological Seminary, and ending his studies there, was licensed to preach as a congregational minister, but was soon thereafter induced to return to St. Louis and take the editorial charge of the St. Louis Observer. His connection with that paper commenced November 11, 1833. His course as an editor was bold and fearless, exhibiting great courage in what was, to his mind, duty. He soon found himself in controversy with Romanism, getting the ill will of many of that faith in St. Louis by his strong denunciation of the use of the United States soldiers stationed there and of the use of the American flag in the public dedication of the Roman Catholic Cathedral of St. Louis. And by them he was in turn denounced as an abolitionist, although at this time he was the furthest removed from that faith. But the cry was raised against him, a northern man in a slave city and state, and for an object, and it had its effect. His office was for a time closed in consequence of the excitement growing out of this. He denounced his persecutors and made a powerful patriotic and for the time being effectual appeal to the public of St. Louis that produced reaction in his favor. 
at this time lovejoy was contemplating removing his office and press to alton and had taken some steps in that direction had visited alton and held consultations with citizens but no decision i think had been made respecting it but now came the murder in st louis of a black man by the name of mackintosh who was a deck hand on a steamer lying at the levee and in retaliation for abuse which he could no longer endure stabbed and killed a white man for this high-handed offense the black man was chained to a tree or stump and burned to death by the mob in that city the crime was justified by the city judge whose name was lawless a good name for the occasion mr lovejoy whose office had been reopened in st louis handled this act of the mob and the charge of judge lawless with severity sparing neither language nor energy in denouncing both this so exasperated the mob that the old cry of abolition was again raised against him and his office destroyed mr lovejoy now in earnest for another place to establish his paper where he could fire into the enemies of peace and good order for he was by no means beaten turned to alton as a base of operation being the nearest town to st louis and in a free state but previous to removing there he had a meeting with a number of citizens of alton representing the business and the property of the city to a great degree they questioned him as to his course in regard to slavery should he come among them to publish his paper for but few of them were then abolitionists mr lovejoy's answers were characteristic of the man he said slavery is a subject that ought faithfully to be discussed in our religious and political journals and as an editor he should never relinquish his right to discuss that or any other subject he might think it his duty to discuss i do not know said he that i shall feel it my duty to discuss it here as fully as i did in st louis there where its enormities were constantly before me i felt bound to lift up my voice against it as in the murder of mackintosh this i claim as my constitutional right a right which i shall never relinquish to any man or body of men but to discuss the subject of slavery is not the object of my paper except as a great moral subject in connection with others my object is to publish a religious journal which shall be instructive and profitable to my fellow citizens as to the subjects i shall discuss and the manner of doing them i shall ever claim the right of determining for myself always accepting counsel from others with thankfulness this was all plain and well understood and mr lovejoy was cordially welcomed as a citizen of alton but notwithstanding all this the night after the press was landed it was destroyed it having been left on the bank of the river overnight the building for its use not being ready to receive it and no one dreaming of any trouble towards it a public meeting of the citizens was called the following day and the sentiments expressed on the outrage committed were so strong and the noble stand to defend the law at all hazards so firmly taken that the reputation of alton as a law-abiding city both abroad and at home was very high at this meeting mr lovejoy reiterated in substance the remarks just quoted and said he claimed the right to discuss any subject holding himself responsible to the law of the land he did not ask the citizens of alton to grant him the right he claimed this as the right of an american citizen it has been charged by the abettors of the mob by which mr lovejoy was killed that he violated a pledge given when he came to alton not to publish abolition doctrines but this is not true lovejoy gave no pledge beyond what the language quoted would imply he was not a man to promise he would not discuss any subject he was as honest as he was fearless in the line of what to him was duty 
another press was bought shipped to alton and put to work the title of his paper being changed from the st louis observer to the alton observer the progressing interest however felt by lovejoy in the subject of slavery although yet calling himself a colonizationist was so strongly marked in his expressions that it raised against him the old cry of abolitionist and it soon led to the destruction of this second press in alton on the night of the twenty second of august eighteen thirty seven note i was absent from the city at this time but take the statement following from persons present quote, the authorities of the city made no serious attempt to save this press or disperse the mob john m crum was then mayor of the city and politely requested the gentleman engaged in destroying the press and property to please disperse and go home and he was answered that they would do so as soon as they had finished the little job they had on hand and in turn they advised the mayor to go home himself lest he might get hurt which was obeyed by the mayor End quote. this act of the mob and the supineness of those in authority and perhaps the constant thinking that he must have all the time kept up on the subject brought mr lovejoy to the front as an avowed abolitionist immediate and unconditional and for him to decide was to act he at once issued a call for a convention to assemble at upper alton for the organization of a state anti-slavery society and on the twenty sixth of october eighteen thirty seven the convention thus called convened at upper alton i had returned to the city in september and was present at this convention and amid all the scenes that so rapidly followed a large number of persons not friendly to the call came into the convention professing to adopt the sentiments and enrolled themselves as members and by their numbers succeeded in passing resolutions in opposition to the intentions of those who issued the call u f linder a lawyer and the then attorney general of the state and john hogan a methodist minister were the most active and acknowledged leaders of those who were bent on obstructing the work of forming a state anti-slavery society for which the call had been issued the meeting however came to its end somehow but whether by adjournment or by all leaving the room i do not now recollect the next day however the friends of the call met at the home of rev t b hurlbert of upper alton and about sixty names were recorded as organizing the state anti-slavery society of illinois and elected their officers the following sabbath october twenty ninth the rev edward beecher then president of jacksonville college preached one sermon in lower alton and one in upper alton with great plainness of speech on the subject of slavery and on the monday following october thirtieth several members of the late convention and many of the principal citizens of alton met in the store of alexander and company to consult on the expediency of establishing the press again in alton and if established of defending it after much deliberation it was advised that mr lovejoy go on and re-establish the press and that it was the duty of friends of free discussion to stand to the last in his defense at a subsequent meeting held in the riley building the same day but more publicly called than the former one the same u f linder and rev john hogan were the prominent leaders of the opposition to lovejoy the minister hogan especially who said to lovejoy that st paul when persecuted in one city fled to another and that he lovejoy should as a christian follow paul's example and flee from alton at this meeting also u f linder attorney general made a speech full of bitter denunciation of lovejoy and of all abolitionists ministers of the gospel etc all aimed to stir up the mob spirit and to intimidate and drive lovejoy from the city 
after he had concluded his effort mr lovejoy obtained the floor he went to the desk in front of the audience laid aside his overcoat and in the most calm and deliberate manner addressed the meeting he repelled the several charges and insinuations that had been made by the principal speakers linder and hogan saying that it was not true that he held in contempt the feelings and sentiments of this community in reference to the great question that was agitating it he respected and appreciated the feelings of his fellow citizens and it was one of the most unpleasant and painful duties of his life that he was called upon to differ from them if they supposed he had published sentiments contrary to those generally held in this community because he delighted in differing from them or in occasioning a disturbance they had entirely misapprehended him but although he valued the good opinion of his fellow citizens as highly as any man could yet he was governed by higher considerations than either the favor or fear of man he was impelled to the course he had taken because he feared god as he should answer to god in the great day he dare not abandon his sentiments or cease in every proper way to propagate them he told the meeting he had not asked or desired any compromise he had asked for nothing but to be protected in his rights which god had given him and which were guaranteed to him by the constitution of his country he asked what infraction of the laws have i been guilty of whose good name have i injured when and where have i published anything injurious to the reputation of alton have i not on the contrary labored in common with the rest of my fellow citizens to promote the reputation and the interest of alton what has been my offence put your finger upon it define it and i stand ready to answer for it if i have been guilty you can easily convict me you have public sentiment in your favor you have your juries and you have your attorney looking at the attorney linder and i have no doubt you can convict me but if i have been guilty of no violation of the laws why am i hunted up and down continually as a partridge upon the mountains why am i threatened with a tar barrel why am i waylaid from day to day and from night to night and my life in jeopardy every hour he also said you have made up a false issue as the lawyers say there are not two parties in this matter between whom there can be a compromise he planted himself upon his unquestionable rights said the question to be decided was not whether a compromise could be effected but whether he should be protected in the exercise and enjoyment of those rights this is the question whether my property shall be protected whether i shall be suffered to go home to my family at night without being assailed and threatened with tar and feathers and assassination whether my afflicted wife whose life has been in jeopardy from continued alarms and excitement shall night after night be driven from a sick bed into the garret to save her life from the brickbats and violence of the mob that sir is the question here his feelings overcame him and he burst into tears many others in the room also wept and for a time the sympathies of the meeting were with him he apologized for having betrayed any weakness on the occasion it was the allusion he said to his family that overcame his feelings he assured them it was not from any fears on his part he had no personal fears not that he felt able to contest this matter with the whole community he knew perfectly well that he was not but where should he go he had been made to feel that if he was not safe in alton he would not be safe anywhere he had recently visited st charles for his family and was torn away from their embrace by a mob he had been beset night and day in alton now if he should leave alton and go elsewhere violence might overtake him in his retreat and he had no more claim for protection upon any other community than he had upon this he had finally come to the determination after consulting his friends 
and earnestly seeking counsel of God to remain in Alton, and here to insist upon protection in the exercise of his rights. If the civil authorities refuse to protect him, he must look to God for protection, and if he very soon found a grave in Alton, he was sure he should die in the exercise of his duty. His manner no man could describe. He was through it all calm, serious, firm, and decided. No epithet or unkind word escaped him, yet he knew he was among deadly enemies. As soon as he left off speaking, he left the building, and Linder again took the floor. He treated as hypocritical cant everything Mr. L. had said. He held him up as a fanatic, as a dangerous man in the community. He was violent against Mr. L. and his friends all, as abolitionists. The chairman, Honorable Cyrus Edwards, arose and in a very respectful but decided manner expressed his dissent from the sentiments just uttered. He urged the importance of maintaining peace and good order and concluded by saying that he wished to take his stand before the country on that. But the meeting was carried on the side of Linder and his followers and adjourned with the evident expressions of hostility and determination to ruin Lovejoy or to pursue him to the death, which was soon accomplished. It had already been published in the city that Reverend Edward Beecher, who has before been alluded to, would preach a sermon in the Presbyterian Church that evening, October 30th, on the Times. Threats had been loudly made that he should not be allowed to do so. The mayor had been informed of those threats and asked to protect the meeting, but made light of it. But the friends of free speech and good order did not feel so quiet about it and proposed to the mayor that they thought they had the power to enforce order if, with his consent, they could carry their guns with them. This he objected to, but said we could privately take them to some place near the church, and if needed we could be called on, and he himself would attend the meeting as we urged him to do. We quietly took our guns to the adjoining house to the church, and not willing to trust the mayor too far, put ourselves under the orders of one of our members, him to obey. When Mr. Beecher had got about halfway through his talk, a stone went through the side window at his head, but missed its mark. The stone had hardly stopped when the call of our leader was made to arms, and a line was, without the order of the mayor, almost in an instant formed in front of the church, extending beyond the front far enough to cover each side of the church. The result was to form the outsiders into as orderly a company of citizens as those on the inside, and Mr. Beecher was allowed to finish his discourse. But when he had concluded and dismissed the congregation, and the citizens with arms in hand were returning to their rooms where they were in the habit of meeting, an altercation took place between the foremost of them and a company of the Mobites in which the breach of a gun held in the hands of Moses G. Atwood, if my memory serves me right, was broken, and the mob were thereafter willing to allow the rest of the guns to pass along. Mr. Lovejoy was one of the number who held those guns, and on returning to his house from the rooms that night, he was waylaid, but passed without being known, as he had exchanged his broad-brim white hat for the cap of a friend as a precaution. When the mob found that Mr. L. had passed them, they attacked his house, but seeing a rifle in Mr. L.'s hands, they prudently retired. Agreeable to the decision at the Alexander Store meeting, another press had been bought and was on the boat shipped from St. Louis to Alton. Precautions had been taken to have it arrive at such an hour as would most likely enable us to get it in store without its falling into the hands of the mob on the banks of the river. To this end, a messenger had been sent below to meet the boat and ask the captain to lay by at the mouth of the Missouri until such time as would enable him to reach the dock at Alton about midnight. 
this was easily done as the boat was owned by some of the parties interested in having the press re-established in alton in the meantime a company of about sixty volunteers had enrolled themselves under the laws as a military company and tendered their services to the mayor to keep the peace of the city this number of men had met for drill that evening at the store where the press would be landed and they were armed with good rifles all well loaded with ball the captain of the boat was ordered to land the boxes containing the press and if any attack was made on the boxes to pull his boat out of harm's way as soon as possible the sixty men inside had concluded to prolong their drill till the press was landed and stored so they were divided into companies and stationed at points overlooking the boxes and all had received orders that if any unauthorized persons should attempt to handle the boxes they were to shoot at the boxes and if anybody was in the way it would appear to be the fault of the intruder a committee of two were sent to call the mayor and have him at the store that at the least he might see it well done he was a bachelor and slept at his office near the store to the first summons he promised to come but was so long in doing it that a second was sent with orders to come with him and show him the way this was effective and the committee and mayor came in together the press however was successfully landed no demonstrations of a mob being made unless perhaps a horn or two blown at a distance the press was soon transferred from the boat to the fourth story of the warehouse belonging to godfrey and gilman and our military company was left to continue their drill till morning or go to sleep as best they could this brings us in detail to the morning of the seventh of november eighteen thirty seven all was quiet in the city the press was out of harm's way boxed up and in the loft of a good warehouse in the keeping of responsible men and no demonstration towards its being unpacked or put in motion as night approached nearly all of the men who had given their names to form the military company went to the building containing the press one loft of which was our drill room and were drilled there until nine o'clock then as no one apprehended any trouble the company was dismissed and each was about going quietly home when mr gilman one of the owners of the store asked if some few of the number would not volunteer to remain through the night as they could be made comfortable for sleeping on the goods in the store and he was intending to stay himself as a precaution against anyone breaking into the store and committing any depredation nineteen men volunteered to stay and with mr gilman made twenty in all left in the store within a short time appearances seemed to indicate that the mob were gathering but no one thought of any serious trouble till edward keating a lawyer and henry w west a merchant came to the building and asked to be admitted to see mr gilman the owner someone not possessed of much judgment for they were both known to favor the mob allowed them to come in they of course soon took in the small number left to guard the building and press and they then informed mr gilman that unless the press was given up to the gentlemen outside the building would be burned over our heads and every man killed consultation was had inside and they were promptly given to understand that the press and the store would be defended some of us were for keeping these parties prisoners till morning that they might share our fate if need be early in the night after the main body had left the twenty men remaining in the building had elected deacon enoch long to act as their captain if anything should occur requiring concert of action and as he had seen service in the war of eighteen twelve eighteen fifteen we supposed him the most fit man for such a case and it was by his orders that these two spies were allowed to depart about as soon as the mob could get their report we understood by the wild shouts among them that our numbers were satisfactory to that side at least and that we would have work to do a council was called by the inside party to take measures for defense and some advised most vigorous defense 
and as severe punishment to the mob if we were attacked as possible but our captain overruled saying our course would be useless sacrifice of human life and if the mob whose shot and stones had begun to come should persist in their attack after being counseled of the consequences then he would select some one man to fire into the mob and no doubt they would instantly disperse he was promptly told by some that they would not be so selected that if they fired into that mob which they were anxious to do they should fire with all present and some took themselves to different parts of the building to defend on their own account but there was thereafter no concert of action by the defenders the building was in fact two buildings with ends to the street and to the river and at one side was a vacant lot the building was of stone over one hundred feet long at the side towards the vacant lot the attacking party were covered by this stone wall the ends of the buildings on street and river would show as two stores three stories on the street and four at the river end owing to the formation of the land the two upper stories were lofts or garrets the roofs of each meeting on the middle wall and no communication between them without going down the stairs of one and up those of the other in the loft of one of these stores was stored stone jugs and jars reuben gary had stationed himself in this loft while the writer was in the other the mob were working in the street in front of both but more particularly under gary's part for the door they were trying to force was more directly under him in his room and my own also were doors fronting the street under the roof with small glass windows in the doors but no other windows mr gary had opened the door in his room over the head of the mob and was amusing himself and them by rolling the jugs and crocks out of the door down on their heads from my standpoint i was getting the benefit of the effect but could not communicate with gary nor let him know that i was there the mob for a time tried throwing up stones but they did not go up with the same effect that the jugs went down and one of their number was selected to cross the street and shoot whoever might be throwing down the jugs whenever he should again appear by the time the party had got to his appointed place where he could command gary's door my rifle was through the glass forming the top of my door and resting on the sash perfectly covering the man in the street i knew him well and saw him clearly for it was a beautiful moonlight night two men had come up to the room where i was to get a good sight of the mob and the street was full they were asking me not to shoot for we were getting the worst of the fight already my promise was ready given not to shoot unless the man raised his gun to shoot gary if he did he could never perform the act but gary knew of the preparations to shoot him and did not know of my position neither could i let him know so he kept out of sight and saved the life of one who bragged the next day that he was the one that shot lovejoy perhaps not one hour later i soon heard mr gary going downstairs and immediately went down myself and we met on the floor below and while we were discussing the situation with the view of returning to our stations he to roll jugs and i to cover him we heard the report of a gun close to us from the inside and the exclamation that a man on the outside was shot our captain had put in force his saving theory and had selected one man to fire and that shot had killed a man by the name of bishop on the outside the ball had entered the top of his shoulder while he was stooping to pick up a stone and had gone nearly through him lengthways i heard one call and ask who fired that gun and dash answered i did i went to the window and saw four men pick up bishop one by each arm and one by each leg and carry him to dr hart's office nearly opposite but i subsequently learned the man was dead when he reached the office with him the shooting of this man seemed to have the effect contemplated by our captain and the mob withdrew but the lull was short they soon returned reinforced and with savage yells threatened to fire the building and shoot every d d abolitionist as we were all then called 
as we might leave the building even at this time no orders were given for any concentrated fire on the mob but many shots were fired but with poor effect the mayor came in the building and we asked him to take us outside to face the mob and order them to disperse or else in their hearing order us to fire and we would pledge our lives to clean them out but he prudently and cautiously and for our good declined saying he had too high a regard for our lives to do that but at the same time he justified our right of defense when he returned to the mob from us he could do nothing his former acts in submitting to being snubbed by the mob who before his face was destroying the press formerly alluded to took from him all power now and he had to look on and see the work of death and of ruin about this time the mob had approached the building with a long ladder and operating on the side of the house next the vacant lot where there was no opening in the long wall they had got the ladder to the roof and a man on the ladder with material to set the house on fire on the roof when volunteers were called for to go out and shoot the man off the ladder the men on the lower floor mr lovejoy amos b roth and royal weller stepped out of the door towards the river and as they stepped clear of the door to get at the side of the building mr lovejoy received five bullets in his body and limbs from behind a pile of lumber nearby where men were concealed probably for the purpose mr roth was also shot in the leg and mr weller also was shot in his leg and had a bullet through his hat that just cleared his head mr lovejoy walked in and upstairs one story to the office saying as he went i am shot i am shot i am dead he was met at the door of the room by all on that floor and died without a struggle and without speaking again the two that were wounded also got back upstairs to the same room very soon there appeared at the river side of the building the same two men who were in the beginning admitted and let out of the building keating and west and calling the attention of whoever was in sight displayed a white handkerchief and called for gilman and said that the building was on fire but the boys would put it out if he would give up the press that was all they wanted and would not destroy anything else nor hurt anyone if the building was surrendered mr gilman then concluded that inasmuch as there was great value in the building of goods and also the interests of many firms all over the state were jeopardized and mr godfrey his partner not present that to save all these interests it was his judgment the buildings and press had best be abandoned to the mob others under the circumstances could say nothing and so it was resolved to give it up and the spies were so ordered to notify their fellows accordingly our guns were secreted in different places and all of the number left the building in a body except lovejoy dead roth and weller wounded and s j thompson who remained till the mob entered and as the men passed by that vacant lot it seemed as if a hundred bullets were shot at them from the mob congregated at the other and higher end of the lot and being thus elevated the balls sung harmless by to the river the escaped congregated in a hardware store on second street a little removed from the scene of action and after a while each went to their several homes and the work of destruction was completed on the press and on the fortunes of the city for all future time end of elijah lovejoy abolitionist journalist killed at alton illinois 1837 from history of the rise and progress of the alton riots cumulating in the death of reverend elijah p lovejoy november 7 1837 by henry tanner published in 1878 Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Incidents in a Retired Life by Frederick William Shelton From Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Incidents in a Retired Life 
by Frederick William Shelton. Last year I had a solitary peach upon a solitary tree, for the early frost frustrated the delicious crop. This only one, which from its golden color might be entitled El Dorado, I watched with fear and trembling from day to day, patiently waiting for the identical time when I should buoy it carefully in my hand, that its pulp should not be bruised, tear off its thin peel, admonished that the time had come by a gradual releasing of the fruit from its adhesion to the stem, and I appointed the next day for the ceremonial of plucking. The morrow dawned, as bright a day as ever dawned upon the earth, and on a near approach I found it still there, and said, with chuckling gratification, There is some delicacy in thieves. Alas! On reaching it, someone had taken a large bite out of the ripest cheek, but with a sacrilegious witticism had left it sticking to the stem. The detestable prints of the teeth which bit it were still in it, and a wasp was gloating at its core. Had he taken the whole peach, I should have vented my feelings in a violence of indignation unsuited to the balmy garden. But as he was joker enough to bite only the sunny side, I must forgive him, as one who has some element of salvation in his character, because he is disposed to look at the bright side of things. What is a peach? A mere globe of succulent and delicious pulp, which I would rather be deprived of than cultivate bad feelings, even toward thieves. Wherever you find rogues, whose deeds involve a saline element of wit, make up your mind that they are no rogues. Up the river. This morning the Shanghai hen laid another egg, of a rich brunette complexion, which we took away, and replaced by a common vulgar egg, intended to reserve the Shanghais in a cool place until the time of incubation. Very much amused was I with the sequel. The proud and haughty superiority of the breed manifest itself by detecting the cheat and resenting the insult. Shang and Eng flew at the supposititious egg with the utmost indignation and pecked it to bits, scratching the remnants of the shell from the nest. There is one peculiarity of these fowl which deserves to be mentioned. When I removed mine from the basket, I thought that the worthy donor had clipped their wings to prevent them from flying away or scaling the henry. On further knowledge, I have learned that their style and fashion is that of the jacket sleeve and bobtail coat. Their eminent domesticity is clearly signified by this, because they cannot get over an ordinary fence, and would not if they could. It is because they have no disposition to do this that nature has cropped them of their superfluous wings and given them a plumage suitable to their desires. Their sober wishes never learn to stray. They often come to the kitchen, but never go abroad to associate with the common fowls, but remain at home in a dignified retirement. Another thing remarkable and quite renowned about this is the oriental courtesy and politeness of the cock. If you throw a piece of bread, he waits till the hen helps herself first, and often carries it to her in his own beak. The feathered people in the east, and those not feathered, are far superior to ours in those elaborate and delightful forms of manners which add a charm and zest to life. This has been from the days of Abraham until now. There are no common people in these realms. All are polite, and the very roosters illustrate the best principles laid down in any book of etiquette. Book of Etiquette What is conventionalism without an inborn sense? Can any man or beast be taught to be mechanically polite? Not at all. Not at all. I have received a present of a pair of Cochin Chinas, a superb cock, and a dun-colored hen. I put them with my other fowl in the cellar, to protect them, for a short time, 
from the severity of the weather. My Shanghai rooster had for several nights been housed there, for on one occasion when the cold was snapping, he was discovered under the lee of the stone wall, standing on one leg, taking no notice of the approach of anyone, and nearly gone. When brought in, he backed up against a red-hot kitchen stove, and burnt his tail off. Before this he had no feathers in the rear to speak of, and now he was bobtailed indeed. Anne sewed upon him a jacket of carpet, and put him in a tea-box for the night, and it was ludicrous on the next morning to see him lifting up his head above the square prison-box, and crowing lustily to greet the day. But before breakfast-time he had a dreadful fit. He retreated against the wall, he fell upon his side, he kicked, and he carried on, but when the carpet was taken off he came to himself and ate corn with a voracious appetite. His indisposition was, no doubt, occasioned by a rush of blood to the head from the tightness of the bandages. When the Shanghai and the Cochin met together in the cellar, they enacted in that dusky hole all the barbarities of a profane cockpit. I heard a sound as if from the tumbling of barrels, followed by a dull, thumping noise like spirit rappings, and went below where the first object which caught my eye was a mouse creeping along the beam out of an excavation of my pineapple cheese. As for the fowls, instead of a salutation after the respectful manner of their country, which is expressed thus, Shang knocks knees with Cochin, bows three times, touches the ground, and makes obsolescence. They were engaged in a bloody fight, unworthy of celestial poultry. With their heads down, eyes flashing, and red as vipers, and with a feathery frill or ruffle around their necks, they were leaping at each other, to see who should hold dominion over the ash heap. It put me exactly in mind of two Scythians, or two Greeks in America, where each wished to be considered the only Scythian, or the only Greek in the country. A contest or emulation is at all times highly animating, and full of zest whether two scholars write, two athletes strive, two boilers strain, or two cocks fight. Every lazy dog in the vicinity is immediately at hand. I looked on until I saw the Shanghai's peepers darken, and his comb streaming with blood. These birds contended for some days after for preeminence on the lawn, and no flinching could be observed on either part, although the Shanghai was by one-third the smaller of the two. At last the latter was thoroughly mortified. His eyes wavered and wandered vaguely as he stood opposite the foe. He turned tail and ran. From that moment he became the verest coward, and submitted to every indignity without attempting to resist. He suffered himself to be chased about the lawn, fled from the Indian meal, and was almost starved. Such submission on his part at last resulted in peace, and the two rivals walked side by side without fighting, and ate together, with a mutual concession, of the corn. This in turn engendered a degree of presumption on the part of the Shanghai cock, and one day, when the dew sparkled and the sun shone particularly bright, he so far forgot himself as to ascend a hillock, and venture on a tolerable triumphant crow. It showed a lack of judgment. His cock a doodle do proved fatal. Scarcely had he done so when the coach in China rushed upon him, tore out his feathers, and flogged him so severely that it was doubtful whether he would remain with us. Now, alas, he presents a sad spectacle his comb frozen off, his tail burnt off, and his head knocked to a jelly while the corn jingles in the throats of his compeers when they eagerly snap it, as if they were eating from a pile of shilling pieces or fivepenny pieces. He stands aloof and grubs in the ground. How changed! Up the river. A clergyman was very anxious to introduce some hymn books into the church, and arranged with his clerk that the latter was to give out notice immediately after the sermon. The clerk, however, 
had a notice of his own to give out with reference to the baptism of infants. Accordingly, at the close of the sermon, he rose and announced that all those who have children who they wish to have baptized, please send in their names at once to the clerk. The clergyman, who was stone deaf, assumed that the clerk was giving out the hymn book notice and immediately rose and said, and I should say for the benefit of those who haven't any, that they may be obtained at the vestry any day from three to four o'clock. The ordinary little ones are one shilling each, and the special ones with the red backs are one shilling and fourpence. The End of Incidents in a Retired Life by Frederick William Shelton Individuality as One of the Elements of Well-Being From Essay on Liberty by John Stuart Mill This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Individuality as One of the Elements of Well-Being by John Stuart Mill we have seen that opinions should be freely formed and freely expressed. How about actions? If a man refrains from molesting others in what concerns him, and merely acts according to his own inclination and judgment in things which concern himself, the same reasons which show that opinion should be free prove also that he should be allowed to carry his opinions into action. As it is useful that while mankind are imperfect, there should be different opinions, so it is useful that there should be different experiments of living, that free scope should be given to varieties of character, short of injury to others, and that the worth of different modes of life should be proven practically. It is desirable, in short, that in things which do not primarily concern others, individuality should assert itself. When, not a person's own character, but the traditions or customs of other people are the rule of conduct, there is wanting one of the principal ingredients of human happiness, and quite the chief ingredient of individual and social progress. No one's idea of excellence in conduct is that people should do absolutely nothing but copy one another. On the other hand, it would be absurd to pretend that people ought to live as if experience had as yet done nothing toward showing that one mode of existence or of conduct is preferable to another. No one denies that people should be so taught and trained in youth as to know and benefit by the results of human experience, but it is the privilege of a mature man to use and interpret experience in his own way. He who lets the world or his own portion of it, choose his plan of life for him, has no need of any other faculty than the ape-like one of imitation. He, on the other hand, who chooses his plan for himself, employs all his faculties, reasoning, foresight, activity, discrimination, resolution, self-control. We wish not automatons, but living, originating men and women. So much will be readily conceded but nevertheless it may be maintained that strong desires and passions are a peril and a snare. Yet it is desires and impulses which constitute character, and one with no desires and impulses of his own has no more character than a steam engine. An energetic character implies strong, spontaneous impulses under the control of a strong will, and such characters are desirable since the danger which threatens modern society is not excess but deficiency of personal impulses and preferences everyone nowadays asks what is usually done by persons of my station and pecuniary circumstances or worse still what is usually done by persons of a station and circumstance superior to mine the consequence is that through failure to follow their own nature they have no nature to follow their human capacities are withered and starved and are incapable of any strong pleasures or opinions properly their own. It is not by pruning away the individual 
but by cultivating it wisely that human beings become valuable to themselves and to others and that human life becomes rich diversified and interesting individuality is equivalent to development and in proportion to the latitude given to individuality an age becomes noteworthy or the reverse unfortunately the general tendency of things is to render mediocrity the ascendant power at present individuals are lost in the crowd and it is almost a triviality to say that public opinion now rules the world the public opinion is the opinion of collective mediocrity and it is expressed by mediocre men the initiation of all wise and noble opinions comes from individuals and the individuality of those who stand on the higher eminences of thought is necessary to correct the tendency that makes mankind acquiesce to customary and popular opinions end of individuality as one of the elements of well-being by john stuart mill is marijuana addictive from the national institute on drug abuse june 2018 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org is marijuana addictive marijuana use can lead to the development of problem use known as a marijuana use disorder which takes the form of addiction in severe cases recent data suggest that thirty per cent of those who use marijuana may have some degree of marijuana use disorder people who begin using marijuana before the age of eighteen are four to seven times more likely to develop marijuana use disorder than adults marijuana use disorders are often associated with dependence in which a person feels withdrawal symptoms when not taking the drug people who use marijuana frequently often report irritability mood and sleep difficulties decreased appetite cravings restlessness and or various forms of physical discomfort that peak within the first week after quitting and last up to two weeks marijuana dependence occurs when the brain adapts to large amounts of the drug by reducing production of and sensitivity to its own endocannabinoid neurotransmitters marijuana use disorder becomes addiction when the person cannot stop using the drug even though it interferes with many aspects of his or her life estimates of the number of people addicted to marijuana are controversial in part because epidemiological studies of substance use often use dependence as a proxy for addiction even though it is possible to be dependent without being addicted those studies suggest that nine per cent of people who use marijuana will become dependent on it rising to about seventeen per cent in those who start using it in their teens in two thousand fifteen about four million people in the united states met the diagnostic criteria for a marijuana use disorder one hundred and thirty eight thousand voluntarily sought treatment for their marijuana use rising potency marijuana potency as detected in confiscated samples has steadily increased over the past few decades in the early 1990s the average thc content in confiscated marijuana samples was roughly 3.8 per cent in 2014 it was 12.2 per cent the average marijuana extract contains more than 50 per cent thc with some samples exceeding 80 per cent these trends raise concerns that the consequences of marijuana use could be worse than in the past particularly among those who are new to marijuana use or in young people whose brains are still developing see what are marijuana's long-term effects on the brain 
researchers do not yet know the full extent of the consequences when the body and the brain especially the developing brain are exposed to high concentrations of thc or whether the recent increases in emergency department visits by people testing positive for marijuana are related to rising potency the extent to which people adjust for increased potency by using less or by smoking it differently is also unknown recent studies suggest that experienced people may adjust the amount they smoke and how much they inhale based on the believed strength of the marijuana they are using but they are not able to fully compensate for variations in potency End of Is Marijuana Addictive? from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, June of 2018. John Constable Sells His First Landscape Painting, 1814, an excerpt from Memoirs of the Life of John Constable by C. R. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. So little was Constable's art as yet appreciated that the sale of two of his pictures this year must be mentioned as an extraordinary event. A small one exhibited at the British Gallery to Mr. Alnutt and a larger one of a lock to Mr. James Carpenter. The picture purchased by Mr. Alnutt led to an acquaintance between Constable and that gentleman, who has recently favored me with the following account of its commencement. Dear Sir, many years ago I purchased at the British Institution a painting by Mr. Constable, but as I did not quite like the effect of the sky, I was foolish enough to have that obliterated and a new one put in by another artist, which, though extremely beautiful, did not harmonize with the other parts of the picture. Some years after, I got a friend of Mr. Constable to ask him if he would be kind enough to restore the picture to its original state, to which he readily assented. Having a very beautiful painting by Mr., now Sir, Augustus Calcott, which was nearly of the same size, but not quite so high, I sent it to Mr. Constable together with his own, and expressed a wish that, if he could do it without injury to the picture, he would reduce the size of it in height by lowering the sky so as to make it nearer the size of Mr. Calcott's, to which I wished it to hang as a companion. When I understood from him that it was ready for me, I called at his house to see it, and this was the first interview I ever had with him. He asked me how I liked it, to which I replied I was perfectly satisfied and wished to know what I was indebted to him for what he had done to it, in order that I might settle the account. He then said he had no charge to make, as he felt himself under an obligation to me, which he wished to acknowledge and was happy he now had an opportunity of doing so. I told him I was not aware of any obligation, and therefore wished he would name a price, to which he replied that I had been the means of making a painter of him, by buying the first picture he ever sold to a stranger, which gave him so much encouragement that he determined to pursue a profession in which his friends had great doubts of his success. He likewise added, that wishing to make the picture as acceptable to me as possible, he had, instead of reducing the height of the old picture, painted an entirely new one of the same subject, exactly of the size of the one by Calcott, and that if I was satisfied with the exchange, which of course I was, it gave him much pleasure. I remain, dear sir, yours very faithfully, John Alnutt, Clapham Common, February 2nd, 1843. End of John Constable Sells His First Landscape Painting, 1814. An excerpt from Memoirs of the Life of John Constable by C. R. Leslie.
read for librivox by sue anderson luck from the man that corrupted hadleyburg and other stories by mark twain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dale grothman luck by mark twain note this is not a fancy sketch i got it from a clergyman who was an instructor at woolwich forty years ago and who vouched for its truth m t it was at a banquet in london in honor of one of the two or three conspicuously illustrious english military names of this generation for reasons which will presently appear i will withhold his real name and titles and call him lieutenant general lord arthur scoresby v c k c b etc 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 what a fascination there is in a renowned name there sat the man in actual flesh whom i had heard of so many thousands of times since that day thirty years before when his name shot suddenly to the zenith from the crimean battlefield to remain forever celebrated it was food and drink to me to look and look and look at that demigod scanning searching noting the quietness the reserve the noble gravity of his countenance the simple honesty that expressed itself all over him the sweet unconsciousness of his greatness unconsciousness of the hundreds of admiring eyes fastened upon him unconsciousness of the deep loving sincere worship welling out of the breast of those people and flowing toward him the clergyman at my left was an old acquaintance of mine clergyman now but had spent the first half of his life in the camp and field and as an instructor in the military school at woolwich just at the moment i had been talking about a veiled and singular light glimmered in his eyes and he leaned down and muttered confidentially to me indicating the hero of the banquet with a gesture privately his glory is an accident just a product of incredible luck this verdict was a great surprise to me if its subject had been napoleon or socrates or solomon my astonishment could not have been greater some days later came the explanation of this strange remark and this is what the reverend told me about forty years ago i was an instructor in the military academy at woolwich i was present in one of the sections when young scoresby underwent his preliminary examination i was touched to the quick with pity for the rest of the class answered up brightly and handsomely while he why dear me he didn't know anything so to speak he was evidently good and sweet and lovable and guileless and so it was exceedingly painful to see him stand there as serene as a graven image and deliver himself of answers which were veritably miraculous for stupidity and ignorance all the compassion in me was aroused in his behalf i said to myself when he comes to be examined again he will be flung over of course so it will be simple a harmless act of charity to ease his fall as much as i can i took him aside and found that he knew a little of caesar's history and as he didn't know anything else i went to work and drilled him like a galley slave on a certain line of stock questions concerning caesar which i knew would be used if you'll believe me he went through with flying colors on examination day he went through on a purely superficial cram and got compliments too while others who knew a thousand times more than he got plucked by some strangely lucky accident an accident not likely to happen twice in a century he was asked no questions outside of the narrow limits of his drill it was stupefying well although through his course i stood by him with something of the sentiment that a mother feels for a crippled child he always saved himself just by miracle apparently 
Now, of course, the thing that would expose him and kill him at the last was mathematics. I resolved to make his death as easy as I could, so I drilled him and crammed him and crammed him and drilled him, just on the line of questions which the examiner would be most likely to use, and then launched him on his fate. Well, sir, try to conceive of the result. To my consternation, he took the first prize, and with it he got a perfect ovation in the way of compliments. Sleep? There was no more sleep for me for a week. My conscience tortured me day and night. What I had done, I had done purely through charity, and only to ease the poor youth's fall. I never had dreamed of any such preposterous result as the thing that had happened. I felt as guilty and miserable as the creator of Frankenstein. Here was a wooden head, whom I had put in the way of glittering promotions, and prodigious responsibilities. And but one thing could happen. He and his responsibilities would all go to ruin together at the first opportunity. The Crimean War had just broken out. Of course there had to be a war, I said to myself. We couldn't have peace and give this donkey a chance to die before he is found out. I waited for the earthquake. It came and it made me real when it did come. He was actually gazetted to the captaincy of a marching regiment. Better men grow old and gray in service before they climb to the sublimity like that. And who could ever have foreseen that they would go and put such a load of responsibility on such green and inadequate shoulders? I could just barely have stood it if they had made him a coronet, but a Captain, think of it. I thought my hair would turn white. Consider what I did. I, who so loved repose and inaction. I said to myself, I am responsible to the country for this, and I must go along with him and protect the country against him as far as I can. So I took my poor little capital that I had saved up through years of work and grinding economy, and went with a sigh and bought a coronetcy in his regiment, and away we went to the field. And there, oh dear, it was awful. Blunders? Why, he never did anything but blunder. But you see, nobody was in the fellow's secret. Everybody had him focused wrong, and necessarily misinterpreted his performance every time. Consequently, they took his idiotic blunders for inspirations of genius. They did, honestly. His mildest blunders were enough to make a man in his right mind cry. And they did make me cry, and rave, and rave, too, privately. And the thing that kept me always in the sweat of apprehension was the fact that every fresh blunder he made increased the luster of his reputation. I kept saying to myself, he'll get so high that when discovery does finally come, it will be like the sun falling out of the sky. He went right along from grade to grade over the dead bodies of his superiors, until at last, in the hottest moment of the battle of, down went our colonel. My heart jumped into my mouth, for Scoresby was next in rank. Now for it, said I, we'll all land in shoal in ten minutes sure. The battle was awfully hot. The Allies were steadily giving way all over the field. Our regiment occupied a position that was vital. A blunder now must be destruction. At this critical moment, what does this immortal fool do but detach the regiment from its place and order a charge over a neighboring hill where there wasn't a suggestion of an enemy? There you go, I said to myself. This is the end at last. And away we did go and were over the shoulder of the hill before the insane movement could be discovered and stopped. And what did we find? An entire unsuspected Russian army in reserve. And what happened? We were eaten up? That is necessarily what would have happened in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred. But no. Those Russians argued that no single regiment would come browsing around there at such a time 
it must be the entire English army, and that the sly Russian game was detected and blocked. So they turned tail, and away they went, pell-mell over the hill and down onto the field in wild confusion, and we after them. They themselves broke the solid Russian center in the field, and tore through, and in no time there was the most tremendous rout you ever saw, and the defeat of the Allies was turned into a sweeping and splendid victory. Marshal Can Robert looked on, dizzy with astonishment admiration and delight and sent right off for scoresby and hugged him and decorated him on the field in the presence of all the armies and what was scoresby's blunder that time merely the mistaking of his right hand for his left that was all an order had come to him to fall back and support our right and instead he fell forward and went over the hill to the left but the name he won that day as a marvelous military genius filled the world with his glory, and that glory will never fade while history books last. He is just as good and sweet and lovable and unpretending as a man can be, but he doesn't know enough to come in when it rains. He has been pursued day by day and year by year by the most phenomenal and astonishing luckiness. He has been a shining soldier in all our wars for half a generation. He has littered his military life with blunders, and yet has never committed one that didn't make him a knight, or a baronet, or a lord, or something. Look at his breast. Why, he is just clothed in domestic and foreign decorations. Well, sir, every one of them is a record of some shouting stupidity or other, and taken together they are proof that the best thing in all this world that can befall a man is to be born lucky. The End of Luck by Mark Twain Marijuana's Lasting Effects on the Brain by Dr. Nora Volkow, Director of National Institute on Drug Abuse, 2004 to the present. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please see LibriVox.org. September 10, 2012 we repeatedly hear the myth that marijuana is a benign drug, that it is not addictive, which it is, or that it does not pose a threat to the user's health or brain, which it does. A major new study published last week in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and partly funded by NIDA and other NIH institutes provides objective evidence that, at least for adolescents, marijuana is harmful to the brain. The new research is part of a large-scale study of health and development conducted in New Zealand. Researchers administered IQ tests to over 1,000 individuals at age 13, born in 1972 and 1973, and assessed their patterns of cannabis use at several points as they aged. Participants were again tested for IQ at age 38, and their two scores were compared as a function of their marijuana use. The results were striking. Participants who used cannabis heavily in their teens and continued through adulthood showed a significant drop in IQ between the ages of 13 and 38 an average of eight points for those who met criteria for cannabis dependence. For context, a loss of eight IQ points could drop a person of average intelligence into the lowest third of the intelligence range. Those who started using marijuana regularly or heavily after age 18 showed minor declines. By comparison, those who never used marijuana showed no declines in IQ. 
other studies have shown a link between prolonged marijuana use and cognitive or neural impairment a recent report in brain for example reveals neural connectivity impairment in some brain regions following prolonged cannabis use initiated in adolescence or young adulthood but the new zealand study is the first prospective study to test young people before their first use of marijuana and again after long-term use as much as twenty years later indeed the ruling out of a pre-existing difference in iq makes the study particularly valuable also and strikingly those who used marijuana heavily before age eighteen showed mental decline even after they quit taking the drug this finding is consistent with the notion that drug use during adolescence when the brain is still rewiring pruning and organizing itself can have negative and long-lasting effects on the brain while this study cannot exclude all potential contributory factors for example child abuse subclinical mental illness mild learning disabilities the neural psychological declines following marijuana use were present even after researchers controlled for factors like years of education mental illness and use of other substances mental impairment was evident not just in test scores but in users daily functioning people who knew the study participants example friends and relatives filled out questionnaires and reported that persistent cannabis users had significantly more memory and attention problems easily getting distracted misplacing things forgetting to keep appointments or return calls and so on unfortunately the proportion of american teens who believe marijuana use is harmful has been declining for the past several years which has corresponded to a steady rise in their use of the drug as shown by nida's annual monitoring the future survey of eighth tenth and twelfth grades since it decreases iq regular marijuana use stands to jeopardize a young person's chances of success in school so as another school year begins we all must step up our efforts to educate teens about the harms of marijuana so that we can realign their perceptions of this drug with the scientific evidence update march twenty one two thousand thirteen a study was published in january two thousand thirteen contesting the interpretation of the large-scale marijuana study i discussed below that heavy cannabis use begun in the teen years and continued into adulthood brings about declines in iq scores the contesting author used simulation models to suggest that other factors such as socioeconomic status may account for the downward iq trend the original authors reported in a rebuttal letter published in the march fourth two thousand thirteen issue of pnas the authors of the first study note that ses could not account for the findings they observed because adolescent cannabis use was not more prevalent in populations with lower ses observational studies in humans cannot account for all potentially confounding variables when addressing change in a complex trait like iq and future studies will be needed to further clarify exactly how much intelligence may be lost as a result of adolescent marijuana use that such a loss does occur however is consistent with what we know from animal studies though limited in their application to the complex human brain such studies can more definitely assess the relationship between drug exposure and various outcomes they have shown that exposure to cannabinoids during adolescent development can cause long-lasting changes in the brain's reward system as well as the hippocampus a brain area critical for learning and memory the message inherent in these and in multiple supporting studies 
is clear regular marijuana use in adolescence is part of a cluster of behaviors that can produce enduring detrimental effects and alter the trajectory of a young person's life thwarting his or her potential beyond potentially lowering iq teen marijuana use is linked to school dropout other drug use mental health problems etc given the current number of regular marijuana users about one in fifteen high school seniors and the possibility of this number increasing with marijuana legalization we cannot afford to divert our focus from the central point regular marijuana use stands to jeopardize a young person's chances of success in school and in life end of marijuana's lasting effects on the brain by dr nora vocal director of the national institute on drug abuse 2004 to the present my first lie and how i got out of it from the man that corrupted hadleyburg and other stories by mark twain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dale grothman my first lie and how i got out of it by mark twain as i understand it what you desire is information about my first lie and how I got out of it. I was born in 1835, and I am well along, and my memory is not as good as it was. If you had asked about my first truth, it would have been easier for me and kinder of you, for I remember that fairly well. I remember it as if it were last week. The family think it was a week before, but that is flattery and probably has a selfish project back of it. When a person has become seasoned by experience, and has reached the age of sixty-four, which is the age of discretion, he likes a family compliment as well as ever, but he does not lose his head over it as in the old innocent days. I do not remember my first lie. It is too far back. But I remember my second one very well. I was nine days old at the time, and had noticed that if a pin was sticking in me, and I advertised it in the usual fashion. I was lovingly petted and coddled and pitied in the most agreeable way, and got a ration between meals besides. It was human nature to want to get these riches, and I fell. I lied about the pin, advertising one when there wasn't any. You would have done it. George Washington did it. Anybody could have done it. During the first half of my life, I never knew a child that was able to rise above the temptation and keep from telling that lie. Up until 1867, all the civilized children that were ever born in the world were liars, including George. Then the safety pin came in and blocked the game. But is that reform worth anything? No, for it is a reform by force and has no virtue in it. It merely stops that form of lying. It doesn't impair the disposition to lie by a shade. It is the cradle application of conversion by fire and sword, or of the temperance principle through prohibition. To return to that earlier lie, they found no pen, and they realized that another liar had been added to the world's supply. For by grace of the rare inspiration, a quite commonplace but seldom noticed fact was born upon their understandings, that almost all lies are acts, and speech is no part of them. Then, if they examine a little further, they recognize that all people are liars from the cradle onwards, without exception, and that they begin to lie as soon as they wake up in the morning, and keep it up without rest or refreshment until they go to sleep at night. If they arrived at that truth, it probably grieved them, did if they had not been heedlessly and ignorantly educated by their books and teachers. For why should a person grieve over a thing which by the eternal law of his make he cannot help. He didn't invent the law. It is merely his business to obey it and keep still. 
join the universal conspiracy and keep so still that he shall deceive his fellow conspirators into imagining that he doesn't know that the law exists it is what we all do we that know i am speaking of the lie of silent assertion we can tell it without saying a word and we all do it we know that in the magnitude of its territorial spread it is one of the most majestic lies that the civilizations make it their sacred and anxious care to guard and watch and propagate for instance it would not be possible for a humane and intelligent person to invent a rational excuse for slavery yet you will remember that in the early days of the emancipation agitation in the north the agitators got but small help or countenance from any one argue and plead and pray as they might they could not break the universal stillness that reigned from pulpit and press all the way down to the bottom of society the clammy stillness created and maintained by the lie of silent assertion the silent assertion that there wasn't anything going on in which humane and intelligent people were interested from the beginning of the dreyfus case to the end of it all france except for a couple of dozen moral paladins lay under the smother of the silent assertion lie that no wrong was being done to a persecuted and unoffending man the little smother was over england lately a good half of the population silently letting on that they were not aware that mr chamberlain was trying to manufacture a war in south africa and was willing to pay fancy prices for the materials now there we have instances of three prominent ostensible civilizations working the silent assertion lie could one find other instances in the three countries i think so not so very many perhaps but say a billion just so as to keep it within bounds are those countries working that kind of lie day in and day out in the thousands and thousands of varieties without ever resting yes we know that to be true the universal conspiracy of the silent assertion lie is hard at work always and everywhere and always in the interest of a stupidity or a sham never in the interest of a thing fine or respectable is it the most timid and shabby of all lies it seems to have the look of it for ages and ages it has mutely labored in the interest of despotism and autocracy and chattel slavery and military slavery and religious slavery and has kept them alive keeps them alive yet here and there and yonder all about the globe and it will go on keeping them alive until the silent assertion lie retires from business the silent assertion that nothing is going on which fair and intelligent men are aware of and are engaged by their duty to try to stop what i am arriving at is this when whole races and peoples conspire to propagate gigantic mute lies in the interest of tyrannies and shams why should we care anything about the trifling lies told by individuals why should we try to make it appear that abstention from lying is a virtue why should we want to beguile ourselves in that way why should we without shame help the nation lie and then be ashamed to do a little lying on our own account why shouldn't we be honest and honorable and lie every time we get the chance that is to say why shouldn't we be consistent and either lie all the time or not at all why should we help the nation lie the whole day long and then object to telling one little individual private lie in our own interest to go to bed on just for the refreshment of it i mean and to take the rancid taste out of our mouth here in england they have the oddest ways they won't tell a spoken lie nothing could persuade them except in the large moral interests like politics or religion i mean to tell a spoken lie to get even the poorest little personal advantage out of it is a thing which is impossible to them they make me ashamed of myself sometimes they are so bigoted they will not even tell a lie for the fun of it they will not tell it when it hasn't even a suggestion of damage or advantage in it for any one this has a restraining influence on me in spite of reason and i'm always getting out of the practice of course they tell all sorts of little unspoken lies just like anybody but they don't notice it until their attention is called to it they have got me so that sometimes i never tell a verbal lie now except in a modified form and even in the modified form they don't approve of it 
Still, that is as far as I can go in the interest of the growing friendly relations between the two countries. I must keep some of my self-respect and my health. I can live on a pretty low diet, but I can't get along on no sustenance at all. Of course, there are times when these people have come out with a spoken lie, for that is a thing which happens to everybody once in a while, and would happen to the angels if they came down here much. Particularly for angels, in fact, for the lies I speak of are self-sacrificing ones, told for a generous objective, not a mean one. But even when these people tell a lie of that sort, it seems to scare them and unsettle their minds. It is a wonderful thing to see, and shows that they are all insane. In fact, it is a country which is full of the most interesting superstitions. I have an English friend of twenty-five years standing, and yesterday, when we were coming downtown on the top of the bus, I happened to tell him a lie. A modified one, of course. A half-breed. A mulatto. I can't seem to tell any other kind now, the market is so flat. I was explaining to him how I got out of an embarrassment in Austria last year. I do not know what might have become of me if I hadn't happened to remember to tell the police that I belonged to the same family as the Prince of Wales. That made everything pleasant, and they let me go, and apologized too, and were ever so kind and obliging and polite, and couldn't do too much for me, and explained how the mistake could have been made and promised to hang the officer that did it, and hoped I would let bygones be bygones and not say anything about it, and I said they could depend on me. And my friend said austerely, You call it a modified lie. Where is the modification? I explained that it lay in the form of my statement to the police. I didn't say I belonged to the royal family. I only said I belonged to the same family as the prince, meaning the human family, of course and if these people had had any penetration, they would have known it. I can't go around furnishing brains to the police. It's not to be expected. How did you feel after that performance? Well, of course I was distressed to find that the police had misunderstood me, but as long as I had not told any lie, I knew there was no occasion to sit up nights and worry about it. My friend struggled with the case several minutes, turning it over and examining it in his mind. Then he said that, so far as he could see, the modification was itself a lie, it being a misleading reservation of the explanatory fact, and so I had told two lies instead of only one. I would never have done it, said he. I have never told a lie, and I should be very sorry to do such a thing. Just then he lifted his hat and smiled a basketful of surprised and delighted smiles down at a gentleman who was passing in a hansom. Who was that, G? I don't know. Then why did you do that? Because I saw that he thought he knew me, and was expecting it of me. If I hadn't done it, he would have been hurt. I don't want to embarrass him before the whole street. Well, your heart is in the right place, G, and your act was right. What you did was kindly and courteous and beautiful. I would have done it myself, but it was a lie. A lie? I didn't say a word. How do you make it out? I know you didn't speak. Still, you said to him very plainly and enthusiastically in a dumb show, Hello, you in town. Awful glad to see you, old fellow. When did you get back? Concealed in your actions was what you called a misleading reservation of an explanatory fact the act that you have never seen him before. You expressed joy in encountering him, a lie, and you made that reservation, another lie. It was my pair over again, and don't be troubled, we all do it. Two hours later at dinner, when quite other matters were being discussed, he told me how he happened along once, just in the nick of time, to do a great service for the family who were old friends of his. The head of it had suddenly died in circumstances and surroundings of a ruinous, disgraceful character. If known, the facts would break the hearts of the innocent family, and put upon them a load of unendurable shame. There was no help but in a giant lie, and he girded up his loins and told it. The family never found out, G? Never. In all these years they have never suspected. 
They were proud of him, and had always reason to be. They are proud of him yet. And to them his memory is sacred, and stainless, and beautiful. They had a narrow escape, Judy. Indeed they had. For the very next man that came along might have been one of those heartless, shameless truth-mongers. You have told the truth a million times in your life, G, but that one golden lie atones for it all. Persevere. Some may think me not strict enough with my morals, but that position is hardly tenable. There are many kinds of lying that I do not approve. I do not like the injurious lie, except when it injures someone else. And I do not like the lie of bravado, nor the lie of virtuous ecstasy. The latter is affected by Bryant, and the former by Carlyle. Mr. Bryant says, Truth, crushed to earth, will rise again. I have taken medals at thirteen world's fairs, and may claim to be not without capacity. But I never told as big a one as that. Mr. Bryant is playing to the gallery. We all do it. Carlyle said, in substance, this. I do not remember the exact words. This gospel is eternal, that a lie shall not live. I have a reverent affection for Carlyle's books, and have read his Revelation eight times, and so I prefer to think he is not entirely at himself when he told that one. To me it is plain that he said it in a moment of excitement, when chasing Americans out of his backyard with brickbats. They used to go there and worship. At bottom he is probably fond of it, but he was always able to conceal it. He kept bricks for them, but he is not a good shot, and it is a matter of history that when he fired they dodged, and carried off the bricks. For as a nation we like relics, and so long as we get them we do not much care what the reliquary thinks about it. I am quite sure that when he told the large one about a lie not being able to live, he had just missed an American, and was overexcited. He told it about thirty years ago, but it is alive yet, alive and very healthy and hearty, and likely to outlive any fact in history. Carlyle was truthful when calm, but give him Americans enough and bricks enough, and he could have taken medals himself. As regards to that time that George Washington told the truth, a word must be said, of course. It is the principal jewel in the crown of America, and it is but natural that we should work it for all its worth, as Milton says in his Lay of the Last Minstrel. It is a timely and judicious truth, and I should have told it myself in the circumstance, but I should have stopped there. It was a stately truth a lofty truth, a tower, and I think it was a mistake to go on and distract attention from its sublimity by building another tower alongside it fourteen times as high. I refer to his remark that he could not lie. I should have fed that to the Marines, or left it to Carlyle. It is just in his style. It would have taken a medal at any European fair, and could have got an honorable mention even at Chicago, if it had been saved up but let it pass. The father of his country was excited. I have been in those circumstances, and I recollect. With the truth he told, I have no objection to offer. It's already indicated. I think it was not premeditated, but an inspiration. With his fine military mind, he had probably arranged to let his brother Edward in for the cherry tree results. But by an inspiration he saw his opportunity in time and took advantage of it. By telling the truth, he could astonish his father. His father would tell the neighbors. The neighbors would spread it. It would travel to all firesides. And in the end, it would make him president. Not only that, but first president. He was a far-seeing boy, and would be likely to think of these things. Therefore, to my mind, he stands justified for what he did. But not the other tower. It was a mistake. Still, I don't know about that. Upon reflection, I think perhaps it wasn't, for indeed it is that tower that makes the other one live. If he had not said, I cannot tell a lie, there would have been no convulsion. That was the earthquake that rocked the planet. 
That was the kind of statement that lives forever, and a fact barnacled to it has a good chance of sharing its immortality. To sum up, I am on the whole satisfied with things the way they are. There is a prejudice against the spoken lie, but none against any other, and by examination and mathematical computation I find that the proportion of the spoken lie to the other varieties is as 1 to 22,894. Therefore the spoken lie is of no consequence, and it is not worth while to go around fussing about it, and trying to make believe that it is an important matter. The silent, colossal national lie that is the support and confederation of all the tyrants, and shams and inequities and unfairnesses that affect the people, that is the one to throw bricks and sermons at. But let us be judicious. Let someone else begin. But then, but I have wandered from my text. How did I get out of my second lie? I think I got out with honor, but I cannot be sure, for it was a long time ago, and some of the details have faded out of my memory. I recollect that I was reversed and stretched across someone's knee, and that something happened, but I cannot now remember what it was. I think there was music, but it is all dim now and blurred with the lapse of time. This may be only a senile fancy. The End of My First Lie and How I Got Out of It by Mark Twain Poisoning by Canned Goods by John G. Johnson, M.D., of Brooklyn, New York, from The Medico-Legal Journal, Volume 2, 1885. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Having had in my practice six cases of corrosive poisoning from eating canned tomatoes, Finding that none of our works on toxicology gave any information on the dangers of canned goods, and none of the medical works accessible furnished anything to guide the physician on this subject, after consulting the chemist and former chemist of the Board of Health of Brooklyn and gaining no information from them, it was thought proper that the matter should be brought before this society, from which has emanated so many laws beneficial to the community that by means of the advice obtained from the eminent lawyers, physicians, and chemists composing your body, such knowledge should be secured as will be of service to physicians in the future should similar cases unfortunately occur in their practice, and necessary legislation be obtained, if that be deemed advisable, to prevent these dangers hereafter. Cases of severe sickness have been reported from time to time in various parts of the country from eating canned foods. I know of none of these that have been thoroughly sifted so as to place the matter in reliable form before those competent to judge of a matter so important to the community as its food supply. While there is no doubt that the preservation of food in hermetically sealed cans has added much to the health and comfort of the public, still it is no less certain that unscrupulous tradesmen have dealt in damaged, unsound, and unwholesome canned food, and that serious sickness has occurred therefrom both in this country and abroad, till public confidence has been shaken and a large portion of the community look with doubt and distrust upon all food thus preserved. That this suspicion is not without foundation is shown by the fact that The Trade, a newspaper published in the canning interest in Baltimore, gives in a single issue the names of 57 firms that deal only in seconds or doubtful goods as a warning to retail grocers not to purchase of them. To still further aid in elucidating this question, I have, through the kindness of your president, been allowed to invite representative men from the canned goods trade to present their views to you upon this subject so that this body should have information from their standpoint to aid in the forming of such opinions as may be deemed best upon this important question. The history of the cases, briefly, is this. On Thursday, March 6, 1884, the family of Mr. K. sat down to a lunch consisting of bread and butter and canned tomatoes. The family consisted of Mrs. K., the mother, Theodora, aged 22, Grace, aged 18, John, aged 13, and Osceola, aged 10. A nephew happening to call at that time also sat down to lunch with them. Mr. K. was not home to lunch. The family are strong, hale, and vigorous, with whose constitution and habits I have been acquainted, having attended the family for over twenty years. 
They all sat down to the table in perfect health. About two hours after the lunch, they were all taken with burning pain in the pit of the stomach, intense thirst, dryness of the throat, retching, and tenesmus. These symptoms increasing, at supper time none were able to be at the table. Mrs. K., thinking that they were suffering from some indigestible food, gave them all a cathartic. The boys, after some hours, were able to throw off the contents of their stomach, but lay around stupid and cross, complaining of the pains in their abdomen while the symptoms in the mother's case and the daughter's continued to increase, and the mother, finding that laxatives and anodynes had no effect, sent for me on the morning of the 10th. At this time, Theodora's case had become alarming. There was severe gastroenteritis, the abdomen intensely tender, the tongue of a fiery red, the tenesmus so severe that the bowel would turn inside out like the finger of a glove, with the severity of the bearing down and the ineffectual efforts to pass the contents of the bowel. She was beginning to sink into a coma, aroused only by the severity of her pains. The mother was suffering with the same symptoms, and the daughter Grace had, in addition, an eruption from head to foot of a fiery red with intolerable itching, and her skin, which is naturally soft and smooth, was as rough as a nutmeg grater. This stupor passed into a coma so profound that I could not arouse her by any means at hand. Even taking hold of the small hair in front of the upper portion of the ear, and lifting the head from the pillow would not cause even a quivering of the eyelids. In the evening of Friday the 14th, she was taken with epileptiform convulsions, so severe and continuous that I instinctively looked to see if there was a crepe on the door each time I drove up to the house. These convulsions continued with increasing severity till Sunday afternoon, when her bowels began to move, when a dark, tarry, black fluid substance passed from her at stool. On this being allowed to stand, on the top was seen floating a glistening fluid which showed rainbow colors like oil on the waters. As the Board of Health had the cases under observation, I directed all evacuations to be kept for their chemist, and this was done, but unfortunately he made no chemical examination. During all the time that she was in this coma and convulsions, she lay in a drenching, colloquative sweat, with thin, thready pulse. After the dark, tarry movements, there were bloody stools, not the small, teasing, straining stools with mucus and blood of dysentery, but hemorrhages of quite a large amount mingled with this tarry matter. As the coma passed off, it was found that there was an impairment of nerve power on the left arm, which gradually subsided, with the exception of the muscles controlled by the ulna nerve. There were no marks or bruises on the arm, and no indication of any straining of the joints from the convulsions, and this paralysis of the left arm was attributed to the effects of the poison. A swelling, localized, the size of the fist, in the left iliac fossa made its appearance, and it was feared that an adhesive peritonitis with perforation of the intestine and fecal abscess would form, but fortunately that has subsided to a large degree, and the probability is that it will cause no further trouble. As the symptoms of the others were similar, varying only in intensity, I will not detain you with the repetition. During the early part of the sickness, she drank largely of milk to quench the intolerable thirst, but that was evidently healthy, as the same milk was served by the same milkman to neighbors, and careful inquiry failed to show that it had disagreed with any. That they were suffering from some irritant poison was evident from the fact that they all sat down to lunch in perfect health, and that all that partook of the lunch were sickened by it. That lunch was bread and butter and canned tomatoes. That it was not caused by the bread and butter was shown from the fact that the husband had eaten of the bread and butter at breakfast and also at supper, and had no trouble. He had not been home to lunch. Also, a lady who came in to help them had taken of the bread and butter for her tea and had no trouble, while the nephew, who had only taken the one meal at the house, and that was this lunch, had suffered severely from the colic, cramps, dizziness, and stupor, and was, after some hours, relieved by vomiting but his pains continued in the abdomen for several days. This limited the poison to the tomatoes. Could it have resulted from spoiled tomatoes? No. Why not? Because the sickness resulting from that would have been simply cholera morbus, vomiting, purging, and cramps. That would not produce vertigo, coma, convulsions, and obstinate constipation. Having for many years attended those in the wholesale grocery business, I know something of the method of preparing tomatoes. After the food is placed in the cans and the cap soldered on, the goods are processed. That is, put into a steam bath. 
the temperature is raised to 240 degrees to 250 degrees Fahrenheit and kept there till a pressure of 25 pounds to the square inch is created in the can. The attendant then thrusts an awl through the hole previously marked in the center of the cap. The gases blow out of the can. The can is then soldered while hot. As the can becomes cold, the heads bulge in and stay bulged in. Now, if decomposition begins, the heads of the can bulge out. The gases that form inside of the can distend and force out the heads. In the language of the trade, such cans are swells. It was a well-known trick of unscrupulous dealers to go round to the wholesale trade and buy swells. By heating and punching another hole, or reprocessing, as it is termed by canners, the gases would escape and then the heads would assume their concave form again. But cans thus treated would then have two solder holes instead of one. I examined the can in question. It had only one solder hole. I went through all the cans in the two crates of these tomatoes left in the grocer's, and none had more than one solder hole, and none were swells. Even if the tomatoes had begun to spoil, she had them cooked, and cooking would have cured them. Every housewife knows that if her preserves begin to sour, cooking prevents the souring. The reason may not be so generally known. The yeast plant and all ferments are killed by heat. These ferments and all low forms of organization, like bacteria, multiply by division. To illustrate, if a chain should break up into separate links, and each separate link grow to make a new chain, and these new chains break up into separate links to again grow and make new chains, this would give you a good idea of the growth of these ferments. So with all these ferments, little buds form on the parent stalk, these fall off and grow, and make new stalks for new buds to grow on. Putrefaction and decay, instead of being death, is really giving birth to myriads of little living plants whose food they furnish. Every decaying apple or banana or tomato, every muddy pool in your streets, every damp spot in your houses, is swarming with these tiny scavengers. They dry up and become spores, and are blown around in the air, and if they light on anything capable of furnishing food, they multiply with wonderful rapidity. Now, heat kills all these. Why does your housewife keep her milk in a cold place? Because cold prevents these ferments from growing. Why does she scald the milk if it threatens to sour? because heat kills these ferments. If she puts the dough in too cold a place, it will not rise. Why? Because the yeast ferments will not grow. If she puts it in too hot a place, it will sour. Why? Because they multiply so rapidly that they devour all the saccharine matter in the flour, and destructive fermentation has taken place. Now heat kills all these ferments, and if the tomatoes had commenced to decay, the heating would have destroyed that danger. It was not spoiled tomatoes. Could the poison have come from the utensils used? They were cooked in a stone crock. That is made of fire clay with a salt glaze. It was for over a month in use, and the family were cleanly. The crock was examined by Dr. Bartley, the chemist of the Board of Health, by Mr. F. N. Barrett, editor of The Grocer, the leading paper of the canning interest, and myself, all agreed it could not be that. Could it be from the spoon used in stirring? This was triple-plated, unworn, and clean. That it came from the tomatoes, and that the poison was in solution, was shown from the fact that the oldest daughter had soaked her bread in the sop or liquid portion, and she suffered the most severely. She had not eaten of any of the tomatoes. The mother had also soaked her bread in the sop, but not liking the taste of it, she had not eaten much of it. She suffered next in severity. The second daughter had eaten the soft part, or ketchup part, as she called it. Her symptoms were next in severity to the mother's, while the boys and the nephew who had partaken of the solid part had gotten off the easiest, having had simply the severe cramps, colic, and finally vomited and laid round stupid that afternoon and evening, and in two or three days the pains in their abdomen were gone and they were at their play. The first impression would be that it was lead from the well-known effects of acid on lead and the fact that lumps of solder are often found in cans as well as the solder that is used in making the joints. The red tongue, the severe colic, the thirst and obstinate constipation looked like lead, but as the cases progressed and we had the stupor, coma, colliquative sweats, and severe and continuous convulsions, it required some other poison besides lead to account for these. It was something more than an irritant. It was evident that they were suffering from some corrosive poison. What could it be? This is an extremely difficult question to determine, as admitted by all authorities on poison, 
when you have none of the original material to analyze. The length of time the poison might have been in the diluting mixture might also modify the usual symptoms. The fact that the mouths, tongues, and throats were not sore or excoriated showed that the poison must have been in a diluted state, or it would have been noticed in the burning sensation produced in the mouth, and the first one who partook of it would have warned the rest. Nothing could be gained by the history from the family in regard to the smell of what had been vomited, or the color or appearance to guide. The only statement was that the tomatoes tasted flat, and the addition of salt and pepper did not bring up the taste, and the color of the tomatoes looked like a faded red. The mother did not pay much attention to the color, because she thought that was because the yellow and red tomatoes being stewed in the same kettle. The symptoms corresponded more nearly with verdigris poisoning, or the acetate of copper, and this seemed the probable cause, as it was a well-known fact that in these canning establishments large copper kettles are used, and verdigris frequently forms on them when acid fruits are stewed and allowed to stand. The kettles used in many of these establishments were known to be copper, and untinned and unprotected in any way from the action of acids. Nonin, in Ziemsen, volume 17, page 590, reports that in the Vienna General Hospital there were 130 cases of poisoning produced in this way, that is, by boiling or preserving food in copper kettles, nine of which proved fatal. He also says that all of these poisonings may become dangerous to life even when the amount of copper is not large enough to be clearly perceived by the taste. The symptoms laid down as resulting from verdigris poisoning are those of a severe gastroenteritis, the existence of great tenesmus, and pains in the large intestine. In comparative, many cases the nervous centers sympathize in a very large degree, as shown by the violent delirium, etc. Convulsions are not unfrequently observed. These symptoms are, however, noticed chiefly in those cases of copper poisoning caused by food in which the diagnosis is not perfectly clear. It was noticed that the tin was eroded from the head of the can around the cap and how far the lead of the solder and the tin combined to make this poison was a matter of doubt. Taking one of these caps to a trained tinsmith, a flood of light was thrown upon the case. He showed me that the cap was not fastened to the head of the can by a resin amalgam, as the sides were, but that the amalgam was made of muriate of zinc. That is, pieces of zinc were placed in muriatic acid and dissolved, and more zinc then placed in the acid till the acid would no longer attack the zinc and this saturated solution of muriate of zinc was painted into the groove of the head of the can. The cap was then placed on and held with a clamp, and the soldering iron passed around. The iron being heated to a great heat, of course the solder held the acid in. It could not escape on the outside of the can, and if there happened too much acid applied to the groove, then as the tin expanded with the heat, it would be forced into the can. That this muriate of zinc amalgam was painted on with a brush, that boys were employed for this purpose, and if they happened to get the brush too full, this acid would be forced into the can. The can was coke tin, the turn tin being easily recognized from the coke tin, the coke tin being known by its bright color, while turn tin is dull and shows the lead in its composition. He said this was a very favorite amalgam with roofers, on account of the quickness with which it could be applied, but the good architects and builders would not allow of its use because it rotted the tin. This gave the explanation of the case. The well-known effect of chlorine as a bleaching instrument would explain the faded condition of the tomatoes, while if the poison had been from the verdigris, then the color would be green from the staining of the verdigris. The same color may be seen in the imported French peas, which are colored with it, and which our health authorities still allow to be sold on the open market. The poison was a muriate of zinc and tin, the acid around the cap having eaten off the tin from the inside of the head of the can. If the acid had not got in the can and attacked this part of the tin, there was no reason why this portion of the tin should not be as bright as the rest of the can. The inside of the can on the side where the resin amalgam was used was as bright as any other part, and the bottom of the can was also as bright around its edges as the rest. The contrast between these joints and that of the cap was so marked that there could be no doubt of the poison. It was a double poison, muriate of zinc and muriate of tin. This, too, explained why it was the eldest daughter who had suffered the most. This poison had become dissolved in the liquid portion of the tomatoes. The oldest daughter had soaked her bread in the juice and eaten it, thereby getting the largest share of the poison. 
The mother, who was the next severest affected, had also soaked the bread in the juice, but not liking it, had not taken much of it. While the second daughter took the catsup part, or soft part of the tomato, and was the next severest affected, while the boys and nephew took the solid part and got off the easiest. Chloride of zinc. Woodman and Tidy, page 221, edition 1887. It is, moreover, a powerful corrosive poison. Several cases are recorded where it has been swallowed accidentally, and with fatal result. Applied externally, it is found to act as a powerful escharotic. The chloride of zinc differs in its action from all other zinc salts by its rapidly coagulating action on liquid albumin and on delicate tissues of the body. Its action on the living body is twofold. First, it is a caustic and an irritant, producing pain and instant vomiting. And second, it exerts a specific action on the motor or organic system of nerves, for after the poison has been taken, the pulse and breathing are accelerated, the voluntary muscles become paralyzed, the pupils dilate, coma supervenes, and death occurs without a struggle. The poison may be found in the tissues, urine, and blood. The heart is usually found distended, and the blood black and uncoagulated. A. W. Blythe, Foods and Poisons, edition 1878, page 452, says, Very serious illness has followed the ingestion of Burnett's fluid in quantity equal to 12 grains of the chloride. Death has taken place from about 100 grains of the chloride, and recovery after 200 grains. The New York Herald of April 18, 1883, and subsequently, had a series of canning articles written by someone who thoroughly understood the business, and the danger of poisoning by the escape of this muriate of zinc flux into the can is specifically pointed out. He reports an interview with a veteran canner, who has sealed thousands of cans, who says that he knows that this muriate of zinc has gotten into the cans he has sealed, and also that this danger has been known in Maryland, and from the fact that State of Maryland has a law prohibiting the use of this muriate of zinc flux. That this acid will attack the tin, as well in a vacuum as out of it, is shown by the facts of this case. I took the care to examine a dozen cans where this muriatic acid amalgam was used, and in all of them there was more or less of the tin dissolved off. In the Herald article was the report of Professor E. B. Stewart, secretary of the Illinois Microscopical Society. He said, I take the liberty of calling your attention to a source of danger, until now unsuspected by me, from the use of canned vegetables an instance of which came to my notice by happening to observe in my kitchen, a few days since, a can which had contained lima beans. The appearance of the upturned lid attracted my attention, and on examining the interior of the can more closely, I found that the coating of the tin had almost entirely dissolved from the iron, only patches remaining in places to show that it had ever been tinned. A portion of its contents was submitted to proper chemical tests, which revealed the presence of tin in large quantity. It is probably well known to your readers that tin is, when taken into the system, poisonous. It has an irritant, caustic, and astringent action, and in extreme doses, convulsions and sometime paralysis occurs. Like most other minerals, it may, when constantly taken in small doses, be retained until serious symptoms appear. And while the use of a single can of vegetables containing a considerable quantity would not be followed by fatal results, the constant use of food strongly impregnated with this metal would, in time, be likely to produce serious consequences. Manufacturers should not find it a difficult matter to secure non-poisonous material for making of cans. By simply leaving the thin plate of tin off the iron, a package is obtained, which, for most vegetables, is unobjectionable. And in those cases where discoloration might follow the use of bare iron, a japanned iron may be substituted. The use of solder can also be done away with by substituting a very hard cement, like the ordinary can wax, which is perfectly insoluble in the acid or other proximate principles of fruit and vegetables. Is it not possible that the corrosion in this case was from the muriate of zinc amalgam, as in my case the tin was attacked? The position the French government has taken with regard to the danger from the lead poisoning in the cans can be best judged from the regulations established by the Director General of Customs of France. I quote from the Herald. The Consulting Commissioner of Hygiene, to whom the question has been submitted, is convinced that as far as the public health is concerned, there are serious objections to permitting the sale of products which, from contact with solder, 
or with surfaces covered with an alloy containing lead, might become the cause of poisoning. The commissioner has consequently reported that there is reason to forbid makers of cans for alimentary conserves to solder on the inside of such cans or to employ, in the manufacture of their cans, tins of other than the best quality. The commissioner of hygiene has added that if manufacturers insist on soldering on the inside of the cans, they ought to be obliged to use pure tin exclusively. The legal aspect of this question is a matter of interest. I quote from Chapter 12 of Elwell's Medical Jurisprudence. It is a well-established principle of law that a vendor of provisions for domestic use is bound to know that they are sound and wholesome at his peril. Van Brocklin v. Fonda, 12 Johnson's Reports, 468. It is an equally elementary principle that in contracts for the sale of provisions, the party, by implication who sells them, undertakes to guarantee that they are sound and wholesome. 3. Blackstone, 165. Blackstone also says injuries affecting a man's health are when, by any unwholesome practices of another, a man sustains any apparent damage in his vigor or constitution, as by selling him bad provisions or wine, by the exercise of a noisome trade, or by the neglect or unskillful management of a physician, surgeon, or apothecary. These are wrongs or injuries unaccompanied by force, for which there is a remedy in damages by a special action on the case. 3. Chitty Black, 91. Second, the action will accrue not against the last vendor when the goods were sold in sealed packages, but against the original manufacturer. This is a point settled by the courts for many years. Notwithstanding, in the course of trade, the goods have passed through many hands and are finally bought and used by the one who is injured thereby. The original maker is liable to the person so injured, and not the grocer who, relying on the correctness of the label, innocently sells the article for what it is not. If, however, that grocer knows that the article is dangerous, or if that knowledge is possessed by any of the parties through whose hands it is passed, if he knows that the article is dangerous, then he cannot evade the responsibility of his unlawful act. An extremely interesting case bearing on this point was taken to the court of last resort and is reported in Chapter 12 of Elwell's Medical Jurisprudence. The case is Thomas and Wife v. Winchester, 2nd Selden's Reports, New York Court of Appeals, 397. The facts proved in the case were briefly these. Mrs. Thomas, being in ill health, her physician prescribed for her a dose of dandelion. Her husband purchased for her what was believed to be the medicine prescribed at the store of Dr. Ford, a physician and druggist, in Casanova, Madison County, where the plaintiff resides. A small quantity of the medicine thus purchased was administered to Mrs. Thomas, on whom it produced very alarming effects, such as extreme coldness of the surface and extremities, feebleness of circulation, spasms of the muscles, giddiness of the head, dilatation of the pupils of the eyes, and derangement of the mind. She recovered, however, after some time from its effects, although for a short time her life was thought to be in great danger. The medicine administered was belladonna and not dandelion. The jar from which it was taken was labeled one-half pound dandelion from A. Gilbert, 108 John Street, New York, jar eight ounces. It was sold for, and believed by Dr. Ford to be, the extract of dandelion, from Jason S. Aspinwall, a druggist of New York. Aspinwall bought it of defendant, believing it to be such. The defendant was engaged at 108 John Street in the manufacture and sale of certain vegetable extracts for medicinal purposes, and in the purchase and sale of others. The extracts manufactured by him were put up in jars for sale, and those that he purchased were put up by him in like manner. The jars containing extracts manufactured by him and those containing extracts purchased by him from others were labeled alike. Both were labeled like the jars in question as prepared by A. Gilbert. Gilbert was a person employed by the defendant at a salary as an assistant in his business. The jars were labeled in Gilbert's name because he had previously been engaged in the same business on his own account at 108 John Street, and probably because Gilbert's name rendered the article more saleable. The extract contained in the jar sold to Aspinwall and by him to Ford was not manufactured by the defendant, but was purchased by him from another manufacturer or dealer. The extract of dandelion and the extract of belladonna resembled each other in color, consistence, smell, and taste, 
but may, on careful examination, be distinguished, the one from the other, by those who are well acquainted with the articles. Gilbert's labels were paid for by Winchester and used in his business with his knowledge and consent. The Court of Appeals sustained the principles laid down above in the following words. The sale of the poisonous article was made to a dealer in drugs and not to a consumer. The injury, therefore, was not likely to fall on him or on his vendee, who was also a dealer, but much more likely to be visited on a remote purchaser as actually happened. The defendant's negligence put human life in imminent danger. Can it be said that there was no duty on the part of the defendant to avoid the creation of that danger by the exercise of greater caution, or that the exercise of that caution was a duty only to his immediate vendee, whose life was not endangered? The defendant's duty arose out of the nature of his business and the dangers to others incident to its mismanagement. Nothing but mischief like that which actually happened could have been expected from sending the poison falsely labeled into the market, and the defendant is justly responsible for the probable consequences of his act. Not only can the canners be made to respond in damages for the continuance to use this virulent poison in their soldering, but they can be made to respond in exemplary damages, that is, the jury may not only award the actual damages they determine a party has suffered, but also such a sum as will make an example of these wrongdoers, so as to deter others from this willful tampering with human life. What are the facts of the case? The danger of this muriate of zinc flux is so well known that its use is prohibited by the laws of Maryland. These dangers have been so thoroughly exposed by the Herald more than a year ago. Their trade journals have fully discussed the matter, so they cannot plead ignorance of this danger. Their representative men are here tonight, and these cases are brought to their notice. Safe measures can be adopted instead of dangerous ones. The resin that makes the outside seam tight will make the seam on the cap equally safe. When a man uses a dangerous means when he could have used a safe one, and human life is imperiled thereby, he cannot escape the consequences of his act. Those that still believe otherwise would profit by reading the cases of Fleet and Semple v. Hollenkamp, reported in Chapter 12 of Elwell's Medical Jurisprudence. The case was taken to the highest court in Kentucky, and exemplary damages sustained through every court and by that of last resort. In this case, Hollenkamp had a prescription of Peruvian bark and snake root put up at Fleet and Semple's drugstore, and their clerk carelessly ground up the bark and snake root in a mill in which Spanish flies or cantharides had been ground before. The clerk, neglecting to clean the mill, the Spanish fly became mixed with the plaintiff's prescription, and he, taking it, thinking it was the medicine ordered by his physician, received serious harm. The Court of Appeals says, whether exemplary damages should or should not be given does not depend on the form of action, so much as upon the nature and extent of the injury done, and the manner in which it was inflicted, whether by negligence, wantonness, or without malice. In these cases, instead of caveat emptor, it should be caveat vendor. The excuse that it was an accidental or innocent mistake will not avail him, and he will be liable, at the suit of the party injured, for damages at the discretion of the jury. In the same decision, in response to the question argued by the attorney for the druggist, as to the druggist being insurers, the Court of Appeals said, we see no good reason why a vendor of drugs should in his business be entitled to a relaxation of the rule which applies to vendors of provisions, which is that the vendor undertakes and ensures that the article is wholesome. Sound public policy in relation to the preservation of health, and even of life, would seem to require that this rule should have a rigid and inflexible application to cases similar to the one under consideration. A suggestion was made to me by a manufacturer of a reason why this poisonous amalgam should not be allowed. It is well known that all labor organized has its trade unions. When a dispute arises between the union and the employers, if the union cannot carry their measures by fair means, they will use foul. Malicious mischief is the rule. In his own business, glass factory, there was a strike. Some of the union men refused to strike. He found that he could not walk across the floor without the glassware breaking to pieces. They had dropped something into the glass while the annealing was going on that rendered it so brittle as to be worthless. He mentioned in other trades how the same malicious mischief had been accomplished. Now, suppose a strike takes place and malicious mischief is ordered. 
how easy to drop a teaspoonful of this poisonous muriate of zinc into some of the cans to hurt the proprietor's business. Surely such a virulent poison should not be too handy. It should not be allowed by any state law or tolerated by the manufacturers themselves. It has been asked, what is the use of your trying to effect a change in this form of soldering the caps? The canned goods organization is so powerful that it can override even state legislation, and they instance the bill at Albany this season to prevent canned goods over a year old being sold in the state. I believe that the canners themselves will make the change. History repeats itself. A quarter of a century ago, all pickles sold in England were colored by verdigris. It was poisonous. Sickness ensued from eating them. Prosecution after prosecution was instituted against the manufacturers for a violation of the law. By the aid of able lawyers, they were enabled to escape. The public began to be demoralized, and they were afraid to use the colored pickles, and the trade suffered. Cross and Blackwell came to the front. They made an honest, uncolored pickle. Every bottle of pickles sold by them bore the label, these pickles do not have the fine green color usually seen on pickles, for that color is produced by verdigris, which is poisonous. These are honest pickles put up in pure cider vinegar. They trusted the public, and the public trusted them, and the enormous fortune they made showed how great was the reward to him who restored the public confidence in a necessary article of food. So, with the wavering confidence of the public in canned goods, the trade will see to it themselves that confidence is restored or their business is gone. Doubt will kill the business. If a mother dreads when she is putting food before her children that she is giving them poison, then she will no more give them that food than she will give them so much poison. To sum up, first, these were not cases of sickness from spoiled tomatoes. Second, they were cases of corrosive poisoning from muriate of zinc and muriate of tin. Third, this poisonous amalgam must be abandoned. Fourth, Exemplary damages at the discretion of the jury will be sustained by the courts for this reckless tampering with human life in using a dangerous means when a safe one could be used. Fifth, the canners have only themselves to thank for the present panic in their business, for they have persisted in this dangerous plan knowing it was dangerous. Sixth, every cap should be examined, and if two holes are found in it, send the can at once to the health board with the contents and the name of the grocer who sold it. Seventh, reject every article of canned food that does not show the line of rosin around the edge of the solder of the cap, the same as is seen on the seam at the side of the can. Eighth, reject every can that does not have the name of the manufacturer or firm upon it, as well as the name of the company and the town where manufactured. Standards have all this. When the wholesale dealer is ashamed to have his name on the goods, fight shy of them. Ninth, press up the bottom of the can. If decomposition is commencing, the tin will rattle, the same as the bottom of the oiler of your sewing machine does. If the goods are sound, it will be solid, and there will be no rattle to the tin. Tenth, reject every can that shows any rust around the cap on the inside of the head of the can. If housewives are educated to these points, then muriate of zinc amalgam will become a thing of the past, and dealers in swells have to seek some other occupation. End of Poisoning by Canned Goods by John G. Johnson, M.D. of Brooklyn, New York. Read by Colleen McMahon. Sermons in Stones at Bloomsbury, the New Sculpture Room at the British Museum by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Through the exertions of Sir Charles Newton, to whom every student of classic art should be grateful, some of the wonderful treasures so long immured in the grimy vaults of the British Museum have at last been brought to light, and the new sculpture room now open to the public will amply repay the trouble of a visit, even from those to whom art is a stumbling block and a rock of offence. For setting aside the mere beauty of form, outline and mass, the grace and loveliness of design, and the delicacy of technical treatment, here we have shown to us what the Greeks and Romans thought about death, and the philosopher 
the preacher, the practical man of the world, and even the Philistine himself, cannot fail to be touched by these sermons in stones, with their deep significance, their fertile suggestion, their plain humanity. Common tombstones they are, most of them, the work not of famous artists, but of simple handicraftsmen, only they were wrought in days when every handicraft was an art. The finest specimens, from the purely artistic point of view, are undoubtedly the two stelae found at Athens. They are both the tombstones of young Greek athletes. In one, the athlete is represented handing his strigil to his slave. In the other, the athlete stands alone, strigil in hand. They do not belong to the greatest period of Greek art. They have not the grand style of the Phidian age, but they are beautiful for all that, and it is impossible not to be fascinated by their exquisite grace and by the treatment which is so simple in its means, so subtle in its effect. All the tombstones, however, are full of interest. Here is one of two ladies of Smyma, who were so remarkable in their day that the city voted them honorary crowns. Here is a Greek doctor examining a little boy who is suffering from indigestion. Here is the memorial of Sanhippus, who, probably, was a martyr to gout, as he is holding in his hand the model of a foot, intended, no doubt, as a votive offering to some god. A lovely stele from Rhodes gives us a family group. The husband is on horseback and is bidding farewell to his wife, who seems as if she would follow him, but is being held back by a little child. The pathos of parting from those we love is the central motive of Greek funeral art. It is repeated in every possible form, and each mute marble stone seems to murmur. Roman art is different. It introduces vigorous and realistic portraiture and deals with pure family life far more frequently than Greek art does. They are very ugly, those stern-looking Roman men and women whose portraits are exhibited on their tombs, but they seem to have been loved and respected by their children and their servants. Here is the monument of Aphrodisius and Attilia, a Roman gentleman and his wife, who died in Britain many centuries ago, and whose tombstone was found in the Thames, and close by it stands a stele from Rome, with the bust of an old married couple who are certainly marvellously ill-favoured. The contrast between the abstract Greek treatment of the idea of death and the Roman concrete realisation of the individuals who have died is extremely curious. Besides the tombstones, the new sculpture room contains some most fascinating examples of Roman decorative art under the emperors. The most wonderful of all, and this alone is worth a trip to Bloomsbury, is a base relief representing a marriage scene. Juno Pronuba is joining the hands of a handsome young noble and a very stately lady. There is all the grace of Perugino in this marble, all the grace of Raphael even. The date of it is uncertain, but the particular cut of the bridegroom's beard seems to point to the time of the Emperor Hadrian. It is clearly the work of Greek artists and is one of the most beautiful bas-reliefs in the whole museum. There is something in it which reminds one of the music and the sweetness of Propertian verse. Then we have delightful friezes of children. One representing children playing on musical instruments might have suggested much of the plastic art of Florence. Indeed, as we view these marbles, it is not difficult to see whence the Renaissance sprang, and to what we owe the various forms of Renaissance art. The frieze of the muses, each of whom wears in her hair a feather, plucked from the wings of the vanquished sirens, is extremely fine. There is a lovely little bas-relief of two cupids racing in chariots, and the frieze of recumbent Amazons has some splendid qualities of design. A frieze of children playing with the armour of the god Mars should also be mentioned. It is full of fancy and delicate humour. We hope that some more of the hidden treasures will shortly be catalogued and shown. In the vaults at present there is a very remarkable bas-relief of the marriage of Cupid and Psyche, and another representing the professional mourners weeping over the body of the dead. The fine cast of the Lion of Chéronia should also be brought up, 
and so should the stele with the marvellous portrait of the Roman slave. Economy is an excellent public virtue, but the parsimony that allows valuable works of art to remain in the grim and gloom of a damp cellar is little short of a detestable public vice. End of Sermons in Stones at Bloomsbury, the new sculpture room at the British Museum by Oscar Wilde Recording by Peter Tomlinson Snow Pudding and Chocolate Sauce by Miss Parloa This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Avai in November 2018 Snow Pudding and Chocolate Sauce From Chocolate and Cocoa Recipes by Miss Parloa Snow Pudding Put a pint of milk in the double boiler and on the fire. Mix three tablespoonfuls of cornstarch with a gill of milk and one-third of a teaspoonful of salt. Stir this into the milk when it boils. Beat the whites of four eggs to a stiff froth and then gradually beat into them half a cupful of powdered sugar and one teaspoonful of vanilla. Add this to the cooking mixture and beat vigorously for one minute. Rinse a mould in cold water and pouring the pudding into it, set away to cool. At serving time, turn out on a flat dish and serve with chocolate sauce. Chocolate sauce Put one pint of milk in the double boiler and on the fire. Shave two ounces of Walter Baker and Company's chocolate and put it in a small pan with four tablespoonfuls of sugar and two of boiling water. Stir over the fire until smooth and glossy and add to the hot milk. Beat together for eight minutes the yolks of four eggs, three tablespoonfuls of sugar and a saltspoonful of salt and then add one gill of cold milk. Pour the boiling milk on this, stirring well. Return to the double boiler and cook for five minutes, stirring all the time. Pour into a cold bowl and set the bowl in cold water. Stir for a few minutes and then occasionally until the sauce is cold. This sauce is nice for cold or hot cornstarch pudding, bread pudding, cold cabinet pudding, snow pudding, etc. It will also answer for a dessert. Fill custard glasses with it and serve the same as soft custard, or have the glasses two-thirds full and heap up with whipped cream. End of Snow Pudding and Chocolate Sauce by Miss Parloa The Use of Fools From The Romance of the Commonplace by Gillette Burgess This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. The Use of Fools by Gillette Burgess. What a dull world it would be if everyone were modest, discreet, and loyal to that conformity which is called good taste. If, in short, there were no fools to keep us amused. What would divert us from the deadly routine of seriousness? What toy scandal would we have to discuss at dinner? What would leaven this workaday world of commonplaces if everyone were gifted with common sense? Is it not, when you stop to think of it, a bit inconsiderate to discountenance buffoonery and to resent innocently interesting impropriety? Should we not, rather, encourage eccentricity with what flattering hypocrisies we may so we shall never be at a loss for things to smile at and talk about a fair sprinkling of fools in the world is as enlivening as a pinch of salt in a loaf of bread they give a relish to life and a flavor with brisk spicery of nonsense that would otherwise be oppressively flat civilized existence 
if it were always cooked up and served to us by Mrs. Grundy herself, would be unpalatable enough. But luckily her infallible recipes are not always carried out, and a few plums and cloves get into her pudding. We may not care to play the part of public jesters ourselves, but the least we can do is to be grateful to those who are willing to become absurd for our benefit. Patronize them daintily, therefore, lest they backslide into propriety. Remember that there is such a thing as enjoyment without ridicule. To make fun of a person to his face is a brutal way of amusing oneself. Be delicate and cunning, and keep your laugh up your sleeve, lest you frighten away your game. But there will doubtless always be enough who are willing to play the guy, whether we encourage or condemn. The fool is a persistent factor in society, and yet the common misconception of his status and economic function is silly and unfair. With the prig and the crank the fool has been reviled from time immemorial, and persecuted out of all reason. He is protected by no legislation. Your fool is always in season, and is the target of universal contempt. Instead of this perpetual fusillade of wits, there should be a closed season for fools to allow them to propagate and grow fearless, after which we could make game of them in safety of a full supply. Since he is, in a way, the lubricator of the wheels of life, the coiner of smiles, he should be carefully bred to keep the greatest possible amount of diversion. He should be trained like an actor that his best points may be brought out. He should be paid a salary or kept in livery to the amusement of the public, with no need or excuse for sobriety. But until the fool is properly appreciated and his place assured, we must put up with amateurs that haunt the streets and drawing rooms. It is too much to hope for the sight of a zany every time we go outdoors. But when we do encounter one, what a ray of sunshine gleams athwart our strict fashions! Poor, sober, dun slaves to style and custom! If we chance upon a woman who dares perpetuate her own radical theories of dress, who combines pink with red, or commits a gay indiscretion in millinery, how superbly she is distinguished, for the moment, from the ruck and swarm of victims to good taste! She is at once an event and a portent. The afternoon is quaintly illuminated with a phenomenon, and we scan with new interest and expectations the dull and sober throng. How small a deviation from the mode, indeed, is necessary to provoke a reviving smile. Every such unconscious laughingstock is a true benefactor, ministering to our sense of superiority. Were we never to see the freaks, we would not know how glorious is our own uncompromising regularity. Truly, if we have sufficient conceit, every one in the world, in a way of thinking, may be considered foolish relative to our own criterion. All the world is queer except thee and me, said the Quaker, and even thee is a little queer. Such praise of fools may seem extravagant or illogical, but if it is so, it must be not because the fool is not helpful and stimulating in society, but because, after all, he is not so easily identified as one might suppose. Celestine tells me she never calls a man a fool, but instead asks him why he does so, and in this way she often learns something. That is the most disagreeable trait of fools. Often, upon investigation, what appears to be genuine nonsense is but a consistent carrying out of a clever and original idea, whose novelty alone excites amusement. The fool just cheats us of our due enjoyment by being in the right. It seems dishonest for a fool to instruct. It is beside the mark and outside his proper sphere. And yet even Confucius is said to have learned politeness from the impolite. To see one's own faults and weakness caricatured spoils the laugh that should testify to the folly. We cannot be assured either that the ass who amuses us by his eccentric absurdities may not eventually cheat us of the final victory 
by proving to be but the vanguard of a new custom to which we or our children must perforce in times to come and fall into line with him far behind only then to count our present attitude foolish and old-fashioned let us therefore laugh while we may for your fool is but a chameleon who refuses to change color what today is errant silliness may tomorrow be good horse sense wherefore it is wise to watch fools carefully when you find them lest the sport spoil overnight and you yourself become ridiculous while the fool takes your place as the amused philosopher the word fad they say is derived from the initial letters of the phrase for a day so we, the followers of the latest mode and mood, are, it would seem, the true ephemera, and the fools who defy the local customs are immortal. The fool is merely an anachronism. All inventors, most poets, and some statesmen have been honored with the title, since we laugh chiefly at what we do not understand. There are more synonyms for fool than for any other word in the language and so we must take our chances and smile at all and sundry at men of one idea hobby riders cranks poseurs managing mamas and antic youth blushing brides and fond parents bounders pennants bigots and hens with their heads cut off laugh at them the character parts in the comedy of life for the show is amusing but be not resentful if you find the privilege of laughing is a common right and you in your turn become a victim for strange as it may seem many of these actors may be so foolish as to think you are the fool yourself the end of the use of fools by gillette burgess a word for autumn by a a mill from modern essays Selected by Christopher Morley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. A Word for Autumn by Alan Alexander Mill. Last night the waiter put the celery on with the cheese, and I knew that summer was indeed dead. Other signs of autumn there may be the reddening leaf the chill in the early morning air the misty evenings but none of these comes home to me so truly there may be cool mornings in july in a year of drought the leaves may change before their time it is only with the first celery that summer is over i knew all along that it would not last even in april i was saying that winter would soon be here Yet somehow it had begun to seem possible lately that a miracle might happen. That summer might drift on and on through the months. A final upheaval to crown a wonderful year. Celery settled that. Last night, with the celery, autumn came into its own. There is a crispness about celery that is of the essence of October. It is as fresh and clean as a rainy day after a spell of heat it crackles pleasantly in the mouth moreover it is excellent i am told for the complexion one is always hearing of things which are good for the complexion but there is no doubt that celery stands high on the list after the burns and freckles of summer one is in need of something how good that celery should be there at one's elbow a week ago a little more cheese waiter a week ago i grieved for the dying summer i wondered how i could possibly bear the waiting eight long months until may in vain to comfort myself with the thought that i could get through more work in the winter undistracted by the thoughts of cricket grounds and country houses in vain equally to tell myself that i could stay in bed later in the mornings even the thought of after-breakfast pipes in front of the fire left me cold. But now, suddenly, I am reconciled to autumn. I see quite clearly that all good things must come to an end. 
The summer has been splendid, but it has lasted long enough. This morning I welcomed the chill in the air. This morning I viewed the falling leaves with cheerfulness. And this morning I said to myself, Why, of course, I'll have celery for lunch. More bread, waiter? Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, said Keats, not actually picking out celery in so many words, but plainly including it in the general blessings of the autumn. Yet what an opportunity he missed by not concentrating on the precious root. Apples, grapes, nuts, and vegetable marrows he mentioned specifically. And how poor a selection! For apples and grapes are not typical of any month, so ubiquitous are they. Vegetable marrows are vegetables, poured rare, and have no place in any serious consideration of the seasons. While for nuts have we not a national song which asserts distinctly, Here we go gathering nuts in May. Season of mist and mellow celery, then let it be. A pat of butter underneath the bough, a wedge of cheese, a loaf of bread, and thou. How delicate are the tender shoots, unfolded layer by layer. Of what a whiteness is the last baby one of all. Of what a sweetness his flavor. It is well that this should be the last rite of the meal. Penis coronat opus. So that we may go straight to the business of the pipe. Celery demands a pipe rather than a cigar, and it can be eaten better in an inn or a London tavern than at home. Yes, and it should be eaten alone, for it is the only food which one really wants to hear oneself eat. Besides, in company one may have to consider the wants of others. Celery is not a thing to share with any man. Alone in your country inn you may call for the celery. But if you are wise, you will see that no other traveller wanders into the room. Take warning from one who has learnt a lesson. One day I lunched alone in an inn, finishing with cheese and celery. Another traveller came in, and lunched too. We did not speak. I was busy with my celery. From the other side of the table he reached across for the cheese. That is all right. It was a public cheese but he also reached across for the celery, my private celery, for which I owed. Foolishly, you know how one does, I had left the sweetest and crispest shoots until the last, tantalizing myself pleasantly with the thought of them. Horror! To see them snatched from me by a stranger! He realized later what he had done and apologized, but of what good is an apology in such circumstances? Yet at least the tragedy was not without value. Now one remembers to lock the door. Yes, I can face the winter with calm. I suppose I had forgotten what it was really like. I had been thinking of the winter as a horrid, wet, dreary time fit only for professional football. Now I can see other things. Crisp and sparkling days. Long, pleasant evenings. Cheery fires. Good work shall be done this winter. Life shall be lived well. The end of the summer is not the end of the world. Here's to October. And, waiter, some more celery. The End of A Word for Autumn by Alan Alexander Mill Report of the Wreck of the Princess Sophia by Ole Morrison E. H. Martin and John D. McPherson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Victoria, British Columbia, March 27, 1919. The Honorable, the Minister of Marine and Fisheries, Ottawa. Sir, I beg to submit the following report, with all exhibits attached pursuant to the scope of the commission issued to me as commissioner and captain e martin c m g royal navy and captain john d mcpherson wreck commissioner of british columbia as assessors dated the third day of january nineteen nineteen to inquire into the loss of the british steamship 
Princess Sophia, on the 24th of October, 1918. Owing to the fact that the ship was lost in Alaskan waters, outside the Canadian jurisdiction, and that all the witnesses who were in a position to describe the conditions existing in the vicinity of the wreck at the time material to the inquiry were residents of alaska we had difficulty in making much progress at the several sittings held at victoria and vancouver at which we exhausted all the evidence of the few witnesses who voluntarily came within the jurisdiction after that it was deemed advisable to proceed to juneau alaska at which point we were advised by the american authorities there the remaining witnesses would be available sittings were therefore held at victoria on the following dates january tenth february tenth and eleventh march tenth thirteenth and twentieth and at vancouver on january thirty first and at juneau twenty sixth and twenty seventh of february signed Ole morrison the Princess Sophia, whose official number is 130620, was one of the coasting fleet of steamboats owned by the Canadian Pacific Railway Company, and plied between Victoria, Vancouver, and Skagway, Alaska, and intermediate ports, carrying passengers and mails. She was built at Paisley, Scotland, by Bo McLaughlin and Company, in the year 1912, and was a single screw triple expansion oil burning steel steamer registered at victoria british columbia she was three hundred and sixty six nominal horsepower two hundred and forty five feet two inches long forty four feet one inch beam and twenty four feet deep gross tonnage two thousand three hundred twenty tons and registered one thousand four hundred forty six tons she arrived in due course of her scheduled time at Skagway, Alaska, on the morning of the 23rd of October, 1918, and left on her return voyage about 10 p.m. Alaska time of that day, also in due course of her scheduled time, carrying very little cargo, 289 passengers and 61 of a crew. She had her full complement of officers and crew. She was in charge of Captain Locke an experienced officer and the other officers were properly certified efficient and experienced in those waters the ship was seaworthy and well found in every respect the weather at the time of her departure from skagway was fine it appears from the information gathered from wireless messages picked up that she struck vanderbilt reef about two a m alaska time on the twenty fourth of october nineteen eighteen a distance from Skagway of 54 miles. Parenthetically, it may be here stated that there is an hour's difference between Alaska time and British Columbia time. Vanderbilt Reef, which lies in latitude 58 degrees 35 minutes 20 seconds north, longitude 135 degrees 0 minutes 30 seconds west, and one mile and a quarter off the line of her course, is a small projecting reef well out in the centre of the southern extremity of lynn canal about equidistant from both shores some three and one half miles the nearest lighthouse being that of sentinel island four miles south the reef is submerged at high tide and is marked by a can buoy the various distances along the line of her course from skagway to juneau are as follows skagway to eldred rock lighthouse thirty miles skagway to point sherman lighthouse thirty eight miles skagway to vanderbilt reef fifty four miles skagway to sentinel island fifty eight miles skagway to juneau one hundred miles from the lighthouse records it would appear she must have encountered heavy squalls of snow before she reached eldred rock thirty miles from skagway with a strong northerly wind which condition continued until about six o'clock that morning the twenty fourth as appears from the following summary taken from the lighthouse records at those points eldred rock lighthouse snowing from eleven ten a m twenty third to six a m the twenty fourth clear from six a m the twenty fourth to one p m the twenty fifth snowing from one p m the twenty fifth to eight a m the twenty seventh sentinel island lighthouse snowing from eight fifteen a m twenty third to six fifty a m the twenty fourth clear 
from six fifty a m the twenty fourth to twelve ten p m the twenty fifth snowing from twelve ten p m the twenty fifth to three forty a m the twenty seventh from that hour as appears from the evidence of those standing by the weather moderated in the vicinity of the reef and remained so until early the afternoon of the same day the twenty fourth during which period passengers could have been transshipped to several crafts standing by and landed without very much if any risk of life during the late afternoon of the twenty fourth the wind again freshened and at four forty five p m captain locke wired the cedar that it was impossible to get passengers off owing to the high seas then running but that probably they could be taken off next morning from then on and during the following day the twenty fifth it appears that the vessels which had stood by during the twenty fourth were unable to render any assistance captain troop who is the manager of the british columbia coast steamship service of the canadian pacific railway company at victoria in the meantime was endeavouring to ascertain the exact condition prevailing and on the twenty fourth wired captain locke inquiring what assistance he was getting and asked what disposition he had made of the passengers this wire was not delivered till the morning of the twenty fifth the following craft were standing by at different hours during the twenty fourth one s s patterson arrival nine a m october twenty fourth departure eight p m october twenty fourth officer in charge captain stidham character u s harbor boat power steam no wireless speed about ten knots capacity one hundred fifty to two hundred passengers length eighty five feet number in crew ten persons two craft estabeth arrival ten a m october twenty fourth departure five thirty p m october twenty fourth officer in charge captain j v davis character mail boat for skagway and sitka motor power gas no wireless speed eight and one quarter knots capacity eighty five to one hundred fifty passengers length sixty five feet number in crew three persons three craft amy arrival eleven twenty a m october twenty fourth departure six forty five p m october twenty fifth officer in charge captain e a mcdougall character ferry boat for alaska gold mining company motor power gas no wireless speed about six or seven knots capacity approximately one hundred fifty passengers length sixty five feet number in crew five persons lifeboats two boats four craft king and wing arrival six twenty p m october twenty fourth departure three p m october twenty fifth officer in charge captain j j miller character seattle fishing boat motor power steam no wireless speed about six or seven knots capacity one hundred passengers length about fifty feet number in crew twenty two persons five craft s s cedar arrival eight p m october twenty fourth departure nine p m october twenty fourth officer in charge captain john w ledbetter arrival four fifty five a m october twenty fifth departure one forty p m october twenty fifth character u s lighthouse tender motor power steam equipped with wireless speed eleven and one half knots capacity four hundred passengers length two hundred feet number in crew about forty persons tonnage one thousand three hundred forty one gross tons power one thousand three hundred horsepower lifeboats four boats six craft lone fisherman arrival three thirty p m october twenty fourth sentinel island only officer in charge captain c r duffy character 
Juno Ferry Boat. Motor Power Gas. No Wireless. Speed Nine Knots. Capacity Two Hundred Passengers. Length Sixty Two Feet. Number and Crew Two Persons. Seven. Craft Sitka. Arrival four PM. Left Friday. Officer in charge Captain Homus. Character Gas Boat. Motor Power not recorded no wireless speed not recorded capacity one hundred passengers eight craft elsinore arrival seven p m october twenty fourth departure ten p m october twenty fourth officer in charge captain abramson character gas boat motor power not recorded no wireless speed six or seven knots capacity not recorded length not recorded number in crew two persons nine craft atlas arrival twelve fifteen october twenty sixth officer in charge captain thompson character gas boat the princess sophia during the time that she was visible appeared to be resting firmly on an even keel as near as can be estimated taking the wireless messages as a guide the ship must have been forced off the reef about five fifteen p m of the twenty fifth it being then dark and the snowstorm at its height when she apparently foundered immediately leaving no survivors next morning the twenty sixth her position was indicated by a few feet of her foremast projecting above the surface of the water a short distance from the south end of the reef there being no survivors it is entirely a matter of conjecture as to how she came to leave the reef after being apparently firmly held thereon for some thirty-eight hours during which there were two periods of high water and each succeeding day the tides were getting appreciably lower however this much seems to be reasonably ascertainable from a study of the meteorological and tidal conditions prevailing at the time in the north pacific and in the vicinity of vanderbilt reef that there was an abnormally high tide arising from various causes there had been a recent succession of southeast gales in the north pacific ocean causing an influx of water into all the narrower waters of this locality the northeasterly gale blowing at the time down lynn canal when she struck would have had a tendency to raise the level of the water at the vanderbilt reef in seeking an outlet through the narrow and intricate channels there there was a low pressure of air the barometer reading twenty nine point four two which according to one school of theorists causes a higher level of water another factor that would contribute to the ship being lightened is that her bottom when she struck may have been so damaged where she carried her oil fuel as to cause the oil to leak out when she struck it was almost the top of high water with a rising barometer the reef being submerged at that period of the tide the margin of water required for absolute buoyancy the ship being light would not be very great it seems therefore having regard to all those circumstances and conditions reasonable to assume that at high water on the afternoon of the twenty fifth of october nineteen eighteen the water rose to a sufficient level for her to become water-borne and then she was swept off the narrow reef on which she had been resting sinking immediately on the opposite side of the reef to that on which she struck when the weather permitted of search being made for traces of any bodies or wreckage a number of her boats were found considerable distances from the reef the boats all had disengaging gear but whether any of them got away from the ship with passengers aboard it is impossible to determine amongst the passengers were the captains officers and crews of several yukon river steamers coming outside for the season navigation having closed on that river and lakes there were also a number of men engaged in mining in alaska and the yukon and doubtless accustomed to travel on this route it is reasonable to assume that their views would prevail in forming any decision as to the desirability of landing of the passengers did such a desire exist during the forenoon of the twenty fourth the evidence is that captain locke was under no restraint dictation or interference in the navigating of his ship in any way by the owners or their agents or servants 
owing to the condition prevailing at the time the cable and wireless services were very much impaired from the evidence adduced the conclusion arrived at by your commission is that the ship was lost through peril of the sea as to why passengers were not landed is a matter of conjecture but your commission begged to submit that from the evidence of all the surrounding circumstances such as the ship being staunch and well officered other craft being in the vicinity and other ships approaching the inhospitable shores and lack of shelter sufficiently near the time of year and weather conditions we are not prepared to find that it was unreasonable for captain locke not to land his passengers in securing witnesses and affording other facilities in the course of our investigation we desire to note the untiring and effective services rendered by the hon thomas riggs jr governor of alaska and his staff and by mr w c dibrell the superintendent of u s lighthouse service sixteenth district bremerton navy yard washington as well as that of other citizens of juneau seward and fairbanks all of which is submitted signed aule morrison commissioner e h martin assessor john d mcpherson assessor end of report of wreck of princess sophia by aule morrison e h martin and john d mcpherson read by phil schempf